May 5th, the continuation of May Day, which actually is every day of the year. I'm Ruthie Gilmore, director of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics. And this is our 2000th annual conference, I think, roughly. But it's our first one in real life for a very long time. And we are delighted to be here together, um, hosted by our comrades and partners in all things, the People's Forum. I'd particularly like to thank David, Saidi, Brian, Chris, Lyon, Tahia, and Claudia, and everybody else here at the Forum who makes this wonderful community, solidarity, comradely project work. I also wish to thank Wynn at the People's Cafe for um, everything that we enjoy from the cafe and also for the dinner that Wynn will have coordinated, coordinated that we'll have later this afternoon. We're grateful to have ASL interpreters, Steffi Steffen and, and Tyler Heron. I'm guessing. <laughs> um, and I also want to thank the um, people from the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics who worked really hard to get us to this day. My buddy, the assistant director of the center, Dr. Mary Taylor. <laughs> Michelle Cannon, who has been tirelessly working on our project day in and day out. New member of the team. Morgan Buck, who is our international member who did our design work from across the pond, but sent us the beautiful image that's on the poster. And I want to remind everyone, take posters, please, and decorate your, your work and living space with them. Right, I think that I have covered our, I've done due diligence for the, with thanks. I've probably forgotten something, and if so, I will add it later. But without further ado, I want to welcome Mary and the opening panel up on the stage, and Mary will introduce everybody. Is this on? Yes, it is. OK. Um, greetings, everyone. I am thrilled to be moderating the first panel, um, Consciousness on Edge, um, with my two fellow speakers here, whom I'm going to introduce one after the other, starting on my far right. Francisca Benitez is an artist born in Chile in 1974, living and working in New York since 1998. Her art practice explores relations between space, politics, and language, being closely linked to the places where she lives and the community she interacts with. Her videos, photographs, performances, and drawings are shown internationally. Recent exhibitions include Riego at Dieke, Santiago, In Support at The Kitchen, New York, New Now at the New Britain Museum of American Art, Connecticut, Uprisings at the Jeu de Pomme, Paris, Paris. <laughs> much wider than a line at site Santa Fe, New Mexico. She graduated as an architect from Universidad de Chile in 1998 and, is a and got a master in fine arts from Hunter College, CUNY. Of <laughs> She's an alto singer in the Stop Shopping Choir and an anti-capitalist direct action performance group based in New York City. To my closer right is Andreas Petrosians, 
um, one version of the pronunciation of his name, who is a writer and editor living in New York City. His work has appeared in The New Inquiry, Historical Materialism, Art Forum, Book Forum, The Brooklyn Rail, AJ Plus Subtext, and Eflux Journal, of which he is the associate editor. He's the founder and co-editor of the editorial project Diversity of Aesthetics. Um, we're going to begin with a video, so we're going to jump off stage so that you have a better view of the screen. Um, so as soon as we're off, um, the video will begin. We assemble to know and to do together. We assemble to make things happen. We want to make things happen, to make new worlds. But we exist in a larger framework that is either at odds with our values or oblivious to our values. Sometimes the larger institution is simply doing something else. Here we have a general assembly inside Chase Bank to discuss what to do about Chase Bank. By having the assembly inside the bank, we make it explicit that we exist on their terms. But at some point, you can see the police enter into our terms. They become part of our meeting. The police are participants in our assembly inside the bank. This can occur because an assembly has a membrane, and the membrane is permeable. Song does this too, but the membrane is more permeable. People enter into the song, the melody, the beat, the repetition, even sometimes just the emotion of a song. People accidentally join song, cross the membrane, and for a moment they are in a new space where there is transformational potential. 
We, the Church of Stop Shopping, the Stop Shopping Choir, we are organized by song. Singing organizes us. Singing the song does most of the work. Breathing, listening, projecting, sounding, thinking, agreeing, committing, deciding, trusting, learning, teaching, changing, being changed. These are just some of the things that happen to us when we sing even a simple song together. Breathing, listening, projecting, sounding, thinking, agreeing, deciding, teaching, changing, being changed. How long would it take to instruct or teach a group of people so they would do all these things at the same time, when even the simplest song achieves them all instantaneously? When we sing together, we are making decisions, making choices, practicing consensus, practicing assembly. Singing is a practice towards assembly. We are guided through the process by the structures of song, the conventions of song. Already we have seen many examples of this in many kinds of places, using the least structured songs stripped down to bare elements, shared musical vocabulary, rhythm, melody, tone, tempo, repetition, call and response. And another thing, song is a place of safety for our emotions. We are freed of so much pain. We can let go of disappointments and expectations. We can also try on other pains, trauma, personalities. In song, in the singing of the song, we can be liberated from our identity and we can simultaneously discover our identity. A song singing can be a hideout for our individuated selves. It can also be a place to show our deepest most individuated selves. It is often both a shelter and a stage. We are both protected and revealed by the song. The oscillation between these two states creates an elastic space where we can grow and change, discover and become. This heightened presence is the opposite of alienation. It is disalienation. The heightened presence we are allowed by the shape and time of song is an unusual space, somewhere to be that is both not here and now and a super here and now. In the Church of Stop Shopping, we use singing as an antidote to capitalism. We use it as a meeting place, as assembly. We know it is a very therapeutic space, a spiritual space, but is it a radical space? Is it a political space? The transformation of a group is the basis of political change. Song can be a radical space because there exists in song the possibility of collective transformation. The more radical we are, the less the song matters and the more the singing matters. Song is invitational and generous. Songs welcome singers. People accidentally join song and are briefly outside themselves. And maybe in that moment, they find themselves opposing the dominant culture, the state. It might feel experimental to them, like a door opening. That might lead them to new understandings, new agreements. What does the group want? How can the group make decisions? Can the group make a plan? Remarkable things happen when we talk deeply with the right balance of structure and non-structure. That's true for singing. 
Remarkable things happen when we sing deeply too, even though singing takes us down a very different road. One where productivity, efficiency, assignment, the work of meeting and doing might not be the primary drivers. Above all, what we can learn from a song is how to exist in time as a group. We learn that we can exist in time as a group. We learn that we can exist in a time and a place as a group, even in extremely repressive and controlled environments. Song can shelter, and it often disarms and slows police and security. Assembly itself often has a way of showing us the questions, the possibility of the questions. For example, what do we want? What do we want? Singing both asks this question and answers this question. Singing together, we learn what it feels like to have what we want as a group. Maybe we don't know exactly what we want. Maybe the core questions are much more complicated than what do we want? What do we need? But one outcome of singing is that we discover what agreement and consensus feel like as a group. And perhaps we are more ready to confront the complexity of other, more difficult questions. What is fair? What is just? Who gets to be safe? Mass movements are made of small groups, each one animated by the moment. Or the mass movement lights up, and these small groups coalesce and emerge from its momentum. It's usually both. Mass movements create and destroy groups, but we know that the emergence of movement depends on the readiness of many small practiced groups. Movements are one part of what we hope to create with assembly, with song. Resilient and cohesive movements, resilient and cohesive revolutions will be built on the resilience and cohesion of networks who practice resilience and cohesion. Singing is cohesion. It's an old technology and we have evolved with it, alongside it. Singing is one of the ways we learn to be together. This kind of singing, just one step from the chanting we expect in movement, is rooted in belief, at the very least belief in itself, in its form. Radical song is ritual, not religious, is sacred, not secular, is meaning, not marketing. Song is a shared language, a system that we agree to believe in temporarily, an almost perfect exercise in imaginary possibility. I am the 
Thank you, Devi. Uh, thank you, Tyler. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for coming, for being here with us. Um, thank you for the invitation, Rudy and Mary in the center. Um, this video, I've, I've watched it many, 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 many times, and I find it very, very inspiring. And every time I see it, I cry again. Um, it's very emotional for me. And I... Uh, decided to open with this video that is uh, created and narrated by our Church of Stop Shopping, narrated by Savi 3D, our director. Um, because it says in 14 minutes everything I would try to say, <laughs> it, I find it really dense and, and important. And um, it really sums the work of the choir, the practice. And that's why I decided to open. I hope you enjoyed it. And also shows you a little bit of uh, something that I hope we can talk a little bit in this panel, which is the solidarity among movements um, and how important it is to uh, meet in public space. And I wanted to start with that thought of like the revolutionary act of coming together. Uh, starting by that and uh, doing this in public space. Um, well, in this video, you see also like intimate spaces, government spaces, all kinds of spaces where then, then we, we go and we interact. And, but it all starts in a, in a very anchored practice of community. Um, today, uh, I wanted to talk really candidly about the process of joining the choir and invite you to join the choir also. <clears throat> We're very open to, to everyone, uh, even though I, Savi just spoke uh, for 14 minutes about song. You don't need to be a singer to be in the Stop Shopping Choir. Um, so I wanted to, um, first I wanted to connect with the manifesto for an independent revolutionary art, just to bring in two quotes from the manifesto to place us to um, this manifesto by Breton, Rivera, and Trotsky. Uh, I'm going to read these two quotes. The opposition of writers and artists is one of the forces which can usefully contribute to the discrediting and overthrow of regimes that are destroying, along with the right of the proletariat to aspire to a better world, every sentiment of nobility and of human dignity. And the second quote I'd like to read is, uh, we believe that the supreme task of art in our epoch is to take part actively and consciously in the preparation of revolution, but the artist cannot serve the struggle for freedom unless his subjectivity assimilates its social content unless he feels in his very nerves its meaning and drama and freely seeks to give his own inner world incarnation in his art. Um, yeah, this is very important because it's about living, this embodied living experience. And the revolution is not some promised land that is over there. It's, it's we are actively creating it in our workplaces, in our homes, in our communities every day. And I think uh, the work of the Stop Shop Inquirer uh, reflects that. Um, a little bit about the start. Um, I was in, uh, okay, where, where do I start actually? I'll tell you where I'm from to begin with. I'm a um, rural kid. I grew up as a rural kid raised in a farm in central Chile, uh, going in dictatorship. I was born in 74, our dictatorship started in 73. So I was 
point is this very controlled, uh, inhumane, uh, despotic system. But as many others, uh, we survived, we, we managed, and there were a lot of people who died, lots that were tortured. Um, but just to place you where I was born, where I grew up. Uh, so I went to, <clears throat> I lived in a very contradictory environment because the mega structure is this dictatorship. I'm in a space of the open space of the farms and the, the land in Chile, which is breathtaking, beautiful in connection with nature. Um, and at the same time, I was going to a French school, Alliance Francaise. Um, but the French school there was an elite school. So it was all the people that went to the school was very uh, the elite right wing I'm generalizing, but so you get an idea. And in the school also, so there was this clash. I had teachers, French teachers, for example, that had to try to teach us without saying anything politically too frontal to the dictatorship. So I remember, I mean, the concepts of liberty, equality, and freedom in this, in this context. It was very complicated. So how did we resolve this? For example, the, my teacher, I remember doing a play that was called Poivre de Cayenne, Pepper of Cayenne, which was a, about a conversation between two prisoners. And we did this beautiful play where we changed the play to embody all the memories of the prisoners as flashbacks. Um, or then, for example, oh, we did the, the taking of the Bastille in school, and we're singing, Asaira, 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 les aristocrates à la lanterne, Asaira, 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 les aristocrates on les pondra. So we could do all these things like there. So, so it was just so you get an idea of the contradictions, you know, uh, growing up. I was almost recruited by the Opus Dei tour. So just, just, just so you get a feeling of. Uh, so uh, I grew up in, in a very neoliberal system. As you can imagine, it was like in Chile, it was a, a neoliberalism on steroids. And, and so the education system also was destroyed by the dictatorship. Everything really like of value was smashed to pieces by the dictatorship. And the education system, of course, was one of those um, uh, par parts that were smashed. And uh, I studied uh, architecture in Santiago and Universidad de Chile. Universidad de Chile is the public university in Chile, the equi equivalent of CUNY here. And at that point already, the, the Universidad of Chile had been attacked by the dictatorship for so many years. It used to be free, now it wasn't free anymore. It was like a really, really competitive process to get in the university, which uh, at the end, people from public school couldn't access to the public university because they had to have like a super top education to be able to compete to get in. So it was just like terrible. Uh, so the education system was already very neoliberalized and, and uh, the university was very disarticulated. And so I came into university when we came back to democracy. So at the same time that I leave the, the farm and I go to the big city, we also leave the dictatorship and we come to democracy. So for me, it was like really, really important in Santiago being in the university um, to my, my worldview, how um, I confronted a lot of things that were imposed on us there. Um, but then thinking about your text, uh, the, the, the conversation that you have with uh, Shalin Rodriguez, and she talked about something really interesting, the neoliberal migrant. I feel like I really fit the bill there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like a neoliberal migrant. I didn't come here as a refugee. I didn't come fearing for my life. Uh, I came here for excitement, you know, so like I, I came fear of my own volition, my choice and, and, and for discovery, you know. Uh, so and I was attracted to New York as the city where all the positions seems to be contained in the city. Any, com every community is here represented, every culture is here represented. So I was really interested in this, um, uh, this multiplicity of views and cultures that it was very different from where I came from, that it was this like big, oppressive, monolithic structures that I felt that they were very difficult to overcome. So 
I guess I was, I took the easy road and I came to New York instead of struggling there. But I did have those choices, you know, I have that privilege to be able to come to New York on my own and stay here. And I was welcomed by my aunt in the beginning, thank you. <laughs> um, she was the first generation that before me uh, came here really, really with nothing, you know, uh, no relationships. So um, I, I just mentioned this, the term that actually mentions uh, um, the neoliberal migrant because I feel like since then I've been trying to actually contest that and not be a neoliberal migrant, be a revolutionary migrant, you know. Um, but yes, I came here with a degree and uh, in arriving here, um, it was, I didn't speak English when I came. I, I, I was an architect and I found a job and I learned English in the job with the multiple dwelling law, the zoning resolution, and that was sort of my textbooks and I slowly, uh, but it was really interesting to work in that little office. It was a very humble architecture office in New York that did all kinds of, of, of work in New York City from renovations, clubs, uh, housing, delis, uh, daycare centers. Um, uh, so it was really like in New York. It was, I wasn't doing corporate architecture or no, nothing like that. And, and so I had like a sample of, of life and the rules of the city, all that in the architecture office. Um, but then, uh, I think I'm expanding too much to so going to the branches, but uh, let me go back to where I, when I arrived. Um, so I started seeing in space some things that's, that happen around me, phenomena that I couldn't explain. I started researching and, and I discovered that I needed to do this work of, of, of um, portraying the very ch rapidly changing environment around me, um, portraying some expressions in public space that went completely unnoticed. And that was how I stopped the practice of an architect and I sort of assumed my condition more as an artist. And uh, I'm gonna cut now from the end of the 90s uh, to 2017. I'm gonna jump really fast now. And I was doing this um, project um, because I wanted to talk about another thing that you guys spoke yesterday that was really beautiful of translation as an act of solidarity. Uh, so I was really depressed. Trump had just uh, been elected and it was, the blow was so big that too many of us, a lot of people felt that we have to change something. I mean, we're not doing enough. We're not doing enough. Something's got to change. So at that, at that moment, I was invited to do a residency in El Museo del Barrio. And I decided to put together a trilingual choir of resistance and go to sing in the streets. And uh, we were going to do it in Spanish, English, and American Sign Language. And basically, I used this opportunity and space and also a space that has a lot of, uh, like, that has a public, the Museo del Barrio, to create this collectively. And Cristina was there. She, she became part of it. And, uh, and in that place, actually, so I started, we started um, together composing, uh, learning protest songs, and we creating our repertoire and rehearsing in Museo del Barrio. And at some point, this call gathered other wonderful humans that wanted to do the same as I, I was trying to do. So they show up and all of a sudden, um, a member of the Stop Shopping Choir, randomly, he didn't know I was there doing this, showed up and we start singing and harmonizing and it was absolutely magical. And I was so elated and he's like, hey, after your residence is over, what, what are you gonna go, what are you doing? Like, I don't know, join us. We've been doing this for 20 years. So I'm like, great. And I have to admit that I've seen the Stop Shopping Choir um, in many marches in the city. Like, for example, I remember in the, the march against the war in Iraq in 2003, they were there, Occupy Wall Street, they were there. Um, and I was a little bit put off by the Reverend. I didn't want to have to do 
I wanna, didn't want to be close to anything that was remotely religious, you know? So I was very like, mm. uh, but then I, years passed, you know, that was like in, in the beginning of the 2000s. And then I ended up being invited to join the Reverend Bill Stop Shopping Choir. So I go to the first rehearsal and I remember, I, w I will never forget the, the experience of entering the room and 30 people in circle. Power, the power of the harmonies, the intensity, the beauty. And at the same time, the, the, the complete realization that I'm like, I'm never going to be able to do this. Like, like I was so amazed and, and in love with it, but it was so difficult. It requires so much. This, this is going to be impossible to do. Look at the complex lyrics and harmonies. And it's like, and, but I, nevertheless, I, I joined. I, I really like research at that time, really more seriously about the work of the Stop Shop Inquiry, and I decided to join. And uh, at that point, I was already very active in anti gentrification struggles in my neighborhood um, and anti gun proliferation, too. And uh, this uh, group really became my community, my core comrades. And uh, I have to say that it's been really interesting um, to work in so, with so many groups, but I have to say that the level of joy that there is in this struggle is it's amazing. It really keeps me going because it's, it's hard work, you know? This struggle it never ends, you're always losing, but if you don't do it, you're gonna, they, they're just gonna put their foot on top of you. Uh, so, it has kept me going, and also it has gave me more strength to be more present also with the, the other movements I'm part of. Um, am, I, am I okay with time or not? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the other thing I wanted to say was, ah, from yesterday's conversation that you, you talk about these micro-histories, about these uh, ask large questions and small places that was very that resonated a lot too in the work i do as an artist and also in the work i do as part of a community of artists working for change mm. i think i'm going to stop there because i think I, I can't find my way anymore uh maybe maybe we'll find my way uh when we talk in the in the in the conversation or but you're on the you're on the path leading us, friend. Hi, everybody. I feel like that's really hard to follow because that was so nice and covers so many things. Um, but I do want to briefly also thank Mary and Fran and uh, Ruthie and everybody at CPCP and uh, everyone here. So. Um, I feel particularly hard to follow that because m I guess mine's going to be kind of dry, but maybe we can make it uh, wet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, well, for the last few years, and I hope you'll forgive me for reading directly, but, but for the last few years, I've been thinking through a proposition formulated by Marina Vishmet, which recasts institutional critique is a kind of a historicized art movement beginning in the 60s through today into what she calls infrastructural critique. And so while she and I have taken several of the same references, uh, the work of Meryl Laterman Eucalys, for example, protests at Goldsmiths University that sought to bring cleaning house in, um, in house around the phrase, who keeps the cube white, um, and also protests at the Whitney in 2018. Today, I wanna speak a little bit more in relation to a wider set of projects as a way of identifying what Natasha Dillon of MTL Plus calls, quote, movement generated theory and action. And this is also a way to avoid what Bishmet, uh, what Bishmet elsewhere refers to as a pathologization of the museum, which in my opinion can only lead to a reformist comportment towards the institution. Furthermore, I've argued that to get around the issues of arts recuperation, commodification, and imbrication in the reproduction of the capitalist mode of production, we need to recognize artists as workers. But this is not to then include them in forms of organization, forms or organizational structures of capital, like mass trade unions or political parties have tried to do in the past. 
So this is not so much a call for proletarian subjectivization, but rather a desubjectivization through artistic and aesthetic practice. To understand artistic and aesthetic production as not exceptional to the capitalist mode of production, but as forms of life and sociality that are happening all around us all the time, as Franz's beautiful vid uh, video showed. So in art, uh, and by art, examples could include paintings and performance, but also sideshows, as the image shows above, um, pamphlets on how to successfully de-arrest comrades, zine and food distribution, tree propagation farms from mutual aid efforts, and so on. And this means that the form of attention to proletarian art is also a place where capital and corollary forms of exploitation and incarceration should not just be critiqued, but then can be contested, looted, abolished, and so on. As Vishmit recently said, critique is just a cutting tool, not the price of admission. So I recently translated an interview with an Italian autonomous Marxist, Mario Tronti, and he brought my attention, uh, reminded me of this great quote from Marx's The Class Struggle in France, where Marx writes, the revolution made progress, not by its immediate tragicomic achievements, but by the creation of a powerful, united counter-revolution, an opponent in combat with whom the party of overthrow ripened into a really revolutionary party. And so Tronti says, it's so terrific to define its immediate achievements as tragicomic is the greatest possible critique of reformism because everything is reformist, pragmatism, the workers' movement, and even the Italian communist movement chased after immediate achievements. The insurrectionary party will only mature when it has a powerful enemy to combat. So so-called critical artistic practice, the kind shown in museums all over the world as an illusory way of performing autocritique, actually does the opposite. It is most interested in a weak enemy, a straw man. Thus the museum, or the university, or the not-for-profit, can be seen here as counter-revolutionary forces, functionalized by power as part of a larger liberal counterinsurgency. First, a demonstrator instructs you to be peaceful and not attack property. Then the museum does a show on forms of this or that radical discourse, while contributing all the same to the coffers of the carceral apparatus. Perhaps even more fitting here is how Jasbir Puar describes the museum and the university as, quote, necropolitically adjacent to policing in prisons. She also calls them forms of community policing, which I think is great. Um, so I've realized that I'm probably going to go over time, so I'm going to blaze over some of the art examples and get to the other stuff. But uh, one historical example that Vishmint and I both take is Meryl Lederman Yukalis' 1969 Maintenance Art Manifesto. Most references to this text think with the first section in which Euclid introduces the double linguistic shift that would become the framework for much of her work. She says all her work is maintenance and all her maintenance is art. Thus everything she does in the home, in the museum, and in between is maintenance, is art. But less remembered is the second part of the manifesto, an exhibition proposal to turn a museum into a waste management site, a way of using the institution's physical space to engage parts of the local, municipal, and spatial infrastructures of the city. So we can think with this, what would it mean to reroute not just some resources of the institution that are divvied up for the production of work or performances, but to conceive of a refunctionalization of that space? Um, and yeah, another example I really like is this guy, Christopher Dargangelo, who I think his strategies anticipate a lot of what we see with uh, kind of radical movements that use art today, but. I worry I won't have time, so maybe we can come back to it. Um, so rather than looking at canonized examples of art that have flirted with or even at times activated what we might consider an infrastructural critique, I think it's important in this context to look at how forms of movement building that have negotiated the forms of violence mediated by the art institution that have sought to break out of these various constraints produced by classical, aesthetic, colonial, Western autonomy. For as Vishmit writes, quote, there's a risk of monumentalizing the institution of art, then setting up enunciation of it as a kind of chamber tragedy about art and only art's primitive accumulations. So in 2008, a large protest movement began against the Whitney Museum of American Art, calling for a board member, Warren Canders, to be removed. Canders is the head of a company called Safariland 
that produces and sells weapons and crowd control ammunitions that have been used all over the world, including Palestine and at the US-Mexico border and Baltimore, I believe. So his removal was just one element of the calls by dozens of community groups in the nine weeks of art and action against the museum. After sustained action by dozens of grassroots community groups, cultural workers, and museum staff members calling for his removal, he resigned. Thinking of the critique of aesthetic autonomy, however, most interesting were the tactics by some of the protesters, at least to me, who described that, that they used the fact that the Whitney was allowing them to hold space in the lobby to their own advantage. In other words, because it was a safer space than the street, this implied a level of protection from the police. However, this was not the case on the Metro, where at least one demonstrator was arrested en route to the museum. Another interesting point that we should remember is that the struggle began when almost 100 workers at the Whitney signed a letter calling for Candace to step down. Among this list were prominent curators, educators, and, and all that stuff. So this point is key, I think. Not only does the institution's money come from sources directly implicated in neocolonial violence, policing, incarceration, extraction, and so on, but their workers here are shown to also be tenants in the neighborhoods where the gentrification is a violent process of erasure. They are also citizens of a city who take the public transit system that soon became a battleground for police violence as the city hired hundreds of new cops to police black youth, um, which now is like, reaching a new level of crisis under the former cop mayor, Adams. So here we move from a critique of the institution in itself to an understanding of the spaces in question in wider geographical infrastructural contexts. Um, Okay, so fast forward to, oh, and this is an amazing work that was done by one of the eight artists and groups who boycotted the show, um, which actually was in the exhibition talking about the um, non-lethal, but obviously lethal crowd control munitions made by Candors. So fast forward to 2021, when the Whitney voluntarily recognized its union. This was shocking after similar attempts at unionizing across the country were met with brutal and pathetically conservative responses to, by museum administrators. The new museum spent humongous sums on union busting law firms as did the Philadelphia Museum of Art after it fired almost 100 workers during the pandemic. This notwithstanding, just in the last two years, workers have unionized at the new museum, the Guggenheim, the Tenement Museum, the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, the Fry Art Museum, and the list goes on. Elsewhere, I have written on the need to approach union formations in museums with a little bit of criticality. On the one hand, there is the threat of sectarianism and chauvinism that can emerge from hierarchical structures, as evident from the post workers critique developed by Autonomia Operaia on the one hand, or James Boggs and many others. But more specifically in the art sector, my critique comes from the fact that typically, and not always, once unions and museums are formed, they stop the political work outside of the museum that was started during the struggle. In so doing, the ossification of a labor dispute ends up enforcing the exceptionality of art, isolating struggles in art from others that they are inextricably linked with. So once a union of cultural workers forms, why not use that block to then deal with the gentrification maintained by the museum or fight alongside the cleaners of the space who are not legally allowed into the same union? All that being said, of course, what people do to build a union the acts of coming together, sharing concerns, building worker power are crucial. So another example that's really great here and more recent is the Strike MoMA movement that happened um, last year, last summer. So in the spring of 2021, a large coalition of artists, scholars, organizers, community groups, professors, educators, and workers penned a collective document called Strike MoMA Frameworks and Terms for Struggle. And this document was the basis for 10 weeks of action at the museum that no longer made demands, and this is key on the institution. As they write in the document, just to give a little bit of background, five MoMA board members, Stephen Tannenbaum, Glenn Dubin, Stephen Cohen, Leon Black, Larry Fink, have all been identified and targeted by different groups over the last year for their ties to war, racist prison and border enforcement systems, vulture fund exploitation, gentrification, the list goes on. Zionist lobbyists, right-wing media moguls, gold mining magnets that pollute waters all over Central and South America, 
those involved with hedge funds extracting wealth from Puerto Rico through debt schemes. So that's kind of the basis for it. And I think we can get into the actual things that happened there a bit more in the conversation. You know, there were instances, instances of physical violence against protesters. There was uh, police violence against Palestinian youth. But for now, I kind of want to just briefly shout out uh, the fact that they were coming together to propose what they called post-MoMA futures, right? There were no demands, which really messed with the heads of MoMA, by the way. And there were no call-outs of people who worked there. I think Fred Moten put it beautifully when he wrote, the point here is that is the comportment towards the institution. But I'm not even going to let the institution come between me and the friends I have who work there or the art I love that is held there, dying of preservation. So how do we praxis, practice the absence of art of the art institution? And how do we practice the absence of the university? And I think these questions from, from Fred Moten are absolutely perfect because they show you that these walls between the city and the art institution or the university or whatever other sort of perhaps obsolete, perhaps rapacious institutional form that separates you from the people around you is actually quite illusory. And I think that's one thing that Strike MoMA got really right. Um, so parallel to what Moten and Harney have talked about with regards to the undercommons and radical practices of study, Strike MoMA's discussion of a strike against modernity and other attempts to become ungovernable, many recent formations and movements have actively worked to uncover forms of rebellion and collectivity that do not necessarily pertain to the strike form or other forms dictated by the capitalist mode of production. Thinking on this, my close comrade Jose Rosales and I initiated a project called Diversity of Aesthetics to think collectively with many others about when the institution's attempts at delineating their borders from an imagined outside world, that of politics, of state violence, of policing, and so on, could be actually become beneficial to struggles undertaken around and through them. And the term of the project actually comes from Natasha Dillon, who conceptualized it to revamp the anarchist dictum diversity of tactics for a decolonial and abolitionist praxis. And that's the first volume there, which was with um, Shalene Rodriguez, Michael Rakowitz, and Stephen Shikadis, and myself. Um, so the first one was really trying to get beyond the thing I was just mentioning, this um, autonomous, or sorry, modernist myth, I would call it, of the inside and outside of some institution, which allows art to become exceptional, which allows the autonomous art object to exist apart from the systems that it's found in. So to think beyond that, I argued that, quote, the terms artist, tenant, worker, aren't specific classes, but rather forms of exploitation or forms of reproduction that can be overcome by creating solidarity networks across occupation across fields, across income levels. To organize across these different boundaries, we also need to understand how liberal counterinsurgency functions. The second you criticize the museum, a well-meaning person might ask, well, then where are we going to put the art? What are we going to do with it? Implying that to antagonize and call for the dismantling of an institution's framework would also mean to call for the destruction of the task it fails to perform. This is similar to liberal retorts to demands for abolishing the police. But who's going to keep us safe? As if the police make our cities any safer. Abolishing the police necessarily implies also thinking about community safety after the police are gone. So one beautiful example that I can point to of this kind of proletarian, if we can call it that, investigative practice through art is the art workers inquiry. So Common Notions published the zine that they put together by this group. Um, it was originally formed inside the Red Bloom Communist Collective, which no longer exists. But they produced an art workers inquiry in the spirit of um, Marx un Marx's unrealized 1880 inquiry, and others uh, produced later, like the Quaderni Rossi in Italy and the Johnson Forest Tendency in the US, a form of worker-run sociology, we could call it. So this document by the AWI demonstrated how artists and art workers can relate to mutual aid work and in building popular power in their own communities. Artists and art workers have skills, networks, and supplies that when taken together with others help create infrastructures that can be used or retooled in the interest of abolition, of struggle, and collective care, which are all intimately interwoven. 
So for example, responses to an inquiry about life after the pandemic included answers like no cops, communism, free MTA, college and preschool should be free, abolish rent and housing for all. Or my favorite, I would like to see the rich run scared and the rest of us really truly do the work we need to do to keep each other safe. So this understanding of community is another way to connect what is done in larger networks, let's say municipal sanitation, food production, medical care even if we think about someone like a group like the Young Lords and what they were doing in terms of caring for one another, with self-organization and self-management common to much artistic and cultural work. It shifts the veneration of skills sellable on the market into tools that are available to communize. What if all of the new mutual aid formations developed during the pandemic were not built as a reaction to temporary crisis, but for longevity and fluidity? And I mean that decisively, not scalability. So similarly, what if the space is managed and organized by artists and the skills and networks cultivated by new numerous mutual aid networks were put to the ends of creating permanent structures of collective social reproduction? So to this end, I'd like to end with a brief invocation of what Veronica Gago and others have called destituent power. So when she writes about the 2001 rebellions in Argentina and Buenos Aires, she writes, the moment of eruption of subjectivities of the crisis that took the form of movements of the unemployed, experiences of self-management in factories and neighborhoods, and practices of alternative and popular economy demonstrated a capacity for opposition and action that was capable of breaking the neoliberal consensus. In our collective militant investigation, we called that power destituent precisely for its capacity to overthrow and remove the hegemony of the political system based on parties and for opening up a temporality of radical indetermination based on the power of bodies in the street. That's what you were saying. So to destitute power, to build, or to destitute constituent power, to build destituent power, is to build collective power in contrast to what is already existing. As Tronti argues elsewhere, it isn't about building things up, but about destroying what is existing. And for this, we must send many forms of subjectivization into crisis. The space of artistic production, one that forgets about the individualizing prospects of the genius author, is one such space where subjectivity can be put into constant crisis. And to do this, art must cease to be an exceptional category. As Vishmit writes, Art is considered to be different from other kinds of labor because of the assumption that our non-artistic labor is homogenous, as opposed to the incalculable particularity of artistic labor. These exclusions are premised on the willful refusal to separate artistic work from artistic labor, and thus ultimately to refuse to see one's work and one's activity in shared conditions that can serve as a basis for political organization. So once we understand labor, the goal should then or once we understand art as labor, the goal should not then be to imbricate this labor force into forms of organization, as I mentioned previously, or into previous cycles or eras of working class struggle. The point as I see it is to then allow for new cycles of struggle to emerge, the riot, the insurrection, looting, that all become tactics among creative labor. In short, to detourn the Breton Trotsky a bit that was mentioned earlier, the move is to destitute, dis, dis destitute institutions and use art to create destituent power. Thanks. So um, we have about 20 minutes left on this panel. And our original plan was to have a little conversation um, take place amongst us up here, but in, in the name of destituting power, I wonder if we might actually open it up to folks in the room and um, so that we have uh, our thoughts circulating in a larger group and use this 20 minutes in a more collective manner. So um, is there anyone that would like to say anything? It doesn't have to be a question.
We're live streaming, so um, yeah, okay. let's um, from now on. Sorry, no, thank you so much. Um, so I had a question about the final point you made about that the goal should not be to integrate artists into organizations. Um, and I wanted to hear you to more to elaborate more upon that. In fact, you're making that argument about workers in general shouldn't be part of organizations. And I asked that part in part, you know, because I think that there's, I mean, obviously that's a huge question on the left, right? But even in your reference to the 2001 uprising in Argentina and like the autonomous kind of theorization of that, I think there's also been a really important kind of reassessment of what the lack of organization of the left meant in that moment and that the left wasn't able to take power in that moment and instead organized parties were. And, um, you know, and then kind of pushed back Argentina into a situation of sort of, you know, liberals versus fascists, basically. And I would say the left lot of lost, lost a lot of ground by not being organized. So I just wanted to hear more of your argument in that way. And also, if again, that's an argument about workers in general. Shall we take one more comment or question, and then we can combine into a conversation about those? Looks like people are still thinking, so maybe we'll go ahead. Also, I was so worried about losing the like amazing threads that you just sketched. So thank you for that great question. Um, specifically at the end, it, I was being a bit provocative on purpose. And I was also speaking specifically about, um, and the kind of the term elides me here, but let's say cultural workers in, in general. Um, I think the question of forms of organization, generally speaking, for, for workers is a really complicated one. And it has to be kind of I would say decided in moment by moment conditions, right? But I was talking specifically about this idea that there are institutions, let's say, like the museum, that serve some sort of function um, in some sort of both aesthetic and political regime. Um, and it fails to perform certain tasks, but then gives itself others. So MoMA operates in a lot of ways like a bank, uh, like a real estate tycoon a way of cleaning money that arrives from the sale of arms uh, you know, in Israel, bringing that money to New York so that people can schmooze at, at parties. And I guess I was thinking there about, you know, Stefan O'Harney has this great thing where he's, he commented on the phrasing of strike MoMA and said, as far as I'm concerned, most people in New York are constantly striking MoMA. <laughs> you know what I mean? They live, they make art together, they, they live their life apart from this machine or you know, and I don't want to like single out MoMA here, but like whatever, pick a thing, you know. And like, uh, what they do is that they take that material or even human capital, if we want to like go down that route. And it and he called it a shredder. He says it shreds it. And what does it produce when that material is shredded? It makes artworks, artists, and museum goers. And so, I wasn't so much critiquing the need for organization. In fact, I think we should always be organizing together. I was more saying that once we come together and this form of collectivity already exists, whatever that is, it doesn't necessarily need to conform to forms of organization that the historical workers movement was using. I think in some sense we're already organized. You know, people are already striking MoMA all the time. People hate the police. Most people hate the police. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it wasn't so much saying that we should forget everything we've learned about how to organize against power. It was more to say that we should recognize that we're already quite organized. Yeah. Oh, well, I see it. I was going to jump in, but I see there are plenty of hands up. Um, thank you both for um, really provocative um, uh, and insightful uh, comments that get us started on our conversation today. I'm really grateful. And thanks for that video that you opened with, Fran. It was really wonderful. And um, I was struck in particular by one of the frequently repeated points made in the video about what happens in singing, like in it, and the, the in and the of um, moving across time. And that 
giving us a strong sense of organization that is other to, how do I want to say, um, furthering racial capitalism, even though it might not be in the moment strong enough to break racial capitalism. And I think that what you talked about after showing the video might run a little against, Andreas, the point that you were just making at the end. And I'd like to hear the two of you talk about it. Um, sharing a sentiment and being organized are far from the same thing, like so far. So if everybody hates the police, great. That's not organization, with, with all due respect. Or if it is, tell me, and then I'll change what I think. So maybe the two of you could talk between yourselves a little bit about what this in the moment is, what makes coherence possible, what you think coherence ought to be like the morning after. And it's, it's kind of the morning after that I think we're all struggling over um, these days. So that's my question. I'll just, I'll just add a, a little bit to that, because um, um, I also agree. I really uh, loved seeing the, the video. And I really love the, the uh, stop shopping choir. And I followed them. And we've actually used an early tape in, in one of our, um, of, of, of the stop shopping choir, uh, an early one about gent uh, gentrification in the Lower East Side. So it's something I'm very familiar with. But one of the things I was struck by in seeing that incredible compilation is something that you talked about, again, the use of space and activating other spaces. And again, I think that gets back to this discussion, spaces that people really occupy as opposed to the museum, which I think you're right in saying that most people strike museums just because they don't use them and they don't feel like it's for them. And so I think that that is an interesting discussion. It's, it's really important to me about also where one puts one energy on building some kind of oppositional culture. Um, and I really think, again, Church of Stop Shopping sees itself as building an oppositional culture and oppositional spaces for people to join in. And in that way, it's very inviting where the museum is not. And what, you know, again, the museum becomes a space also. Even those, you know, institutional critique and people fighting against the museum still accept the kind of hierarchical status and enshrine. So now it's, of course, able, as, as always, to enshrine political artists. But still, it creates a kind of, yeah, a, a hierarchy that is always in opposition to the kind of open uh, organizing and, and horizontal valuing of different kinds of artwork. So again, I mean, I think it sort of says something about what, what Ruthie was, was asking. So I, I would be interested in, in, again, a discussion about those differences and how we uh, move to kind of make a kind of uh, open, oppositional, even revolutionary, dare I say, uh, uh, you know, space for art and other kinds of work, you know, uh, art as work and labor and, and you know, uh, transformation possible. So I'll, I guess I'll get into your question talking about organizing and singing. Um, in organizing, I'll talk, for example, about the work of the Coalition to Protect Chinatown and the Lower East Side. Uh, because it's so large, if not, so I, I rather kind of like talk with examples. Um, with the coalition, we're trying to basically be able to stay in our neighborhood because what happens in, in New York City is that basically single and he unilaterally the real estate uh, uh, lobby powers that be big, big real estate defines the conditions in which we're going to live in the city. They basically unilaterally define what's going to be in the zoning resolution or in these laws that govern space here. So <coughs> uh, with our comrades, for example, in our neighborhood, we have realized that that could be a strategy and a goal to change those rules. So we are organizing to change the zoning. So we came up with our own plan to present to the city, for example. 
And um, so this is, we're not organ being organized by song in this moment. You know, we're being organized with this task at hand and this structure that we are confronting. And it's hard and we have to study so much collectively and every meeting that we have, we have to translate in Spanish and Chinese and, uh, and uh, we have difference of opinions among each other, but we, we advance. But um, in the way I see it different, it's like there's, it's hard. There's very little joy, I guess the joy of like, we're resisting and we're staying here. But it's, um, it's a lot. Like, for example, we, this fight, we started with, our, in, with this possibility of changing the, the laws that govern uh, development in, in our, our neighborhood. But they go so fast, they already got the permits, and now we have to actually take them to court. And uh, now we have to chain ourselves to the buildings. Uh, it's, it's, it's just very stressful, you know, so... Um, we need also movements that are going to bring some joy to our like very arid uh, uh, practice, you know. Um, I don't know if it answers the question, but I'm just trying to point to this like very the dryness sometimes of like uh, a plan uh, versus the sort of warm uh, the warmth of music to sort of be able to do that other thing and um, how we are connected. You know, a, a lot of the, we are connected in, in these struggles, like um, the Bowery Tenant struggle, for example, uh, the Chinatown Working Group Plan struggle. Um, I don't know, I, I'm just uh, thinking, going back again of how do, as, how as a choir, we support our si sister movements and that it's really key. You know, we, the Stop Shopping Choir, don't never act alone and, f and as an end of itself, but always in solidarity with our movements. And, and also, for example, even the way we operate, we use the art structures, let's say an international festival in Austria, we use the plane tickets that we like, we're given to be there to connect with uh, organizing movements over there. Uh, to add, basically, our efforts. Um, I don't know if I answered the question, but a little bit of, of, of that. I might prompt you a little bit, Fran, on Ruthie's question. Um, because in, in the video, I know that's not you speaking, you may not have composed that language, but um, in the video there's uh, some reference to the negotiations that have to go on in a choir, right? So there is organizational form there, right? And that organizational form, I mean, how it transforms into the kind of organizational forms that Andreas is talking about or that we would talk about in like, um, you know, political organization proper, you know, the, 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 the distance might be great, but I mean, just some things that come to mind that begin to bring me towards that is like um, Toy Toy in South Africa, the dance form that became a, um, a manner, actually in Southern Africa, I should say, because it was used um, militarily um, in Zimbabwe, I believe, first. But it's a, it's a, a dance form that comes with a chant, and um, it was then used for training um, for like kind of cardio training, but also people would dance together, and it and it w was I mean you know the the military power the power of the South African state meant that it could only be effective in so many ways, but it was a powerful form of of uniting and moving forward and pushing the enemy forward away from you right so so I guess I. I you know, that's maybe just one kind of example that I would bring. And when I think about the block, I think about also the way that the narrator of the film talks about um, how uh, change is made by groups that come together, right? So I guess I, I feel that there's more that we could talk about in terms of like the sentiment, right? Which, you know, you're emphasizing the sentiment because it's been so important for your own experience, right? But I think you can also talk about it. If you and I, if you were to start to sing a melody, I would harmonize with you. And there's certain forms, you know, there's some kind of, 
not formal, but f form all characteristics of working together in a choir that um, could, in theory, be scaled up, that tell us something about uh, negotiation and working together, that I wonder, I would just maybe push you a little bit to talk about those lessons. I think the <clears throat> we have to go hand in hand, basically. That's what I'm trying to say with this uh, organization and even political parties, you know, because when sometimes an opening happens, like for example, right now in Chile, the uprising in 2019 was so strong that it pushed the political establishment to a corner to accept actually and implement a process to create a new constitution, you know, and uh, so uh, it is important that we are going hand in hand and we participate in each other's events and, and organization. I'll mention, for example, here somebody I admire a lot is the relationship between DSA and all the singing groups, singing solidarity, um, that, for example, uh, because um, we have to be able to advance in those really important moments when you have a left coalition that comes to power, for example, uh, and those kind of things. So it doesn't flop and we're all there. There's a lot to pick up on. The first thing that comes to mind just in response to what you're talking about is um, a book I recently read about the Zad in France, the Zona Defonte. Uh, we are nature defending itself. Were they? It's a wonderful book. Um, yeah, it's Isabel, Isabel Fremu. Oh, it's right here. Isabel Fremu and Jay Jordan. And they talk about the various forms of uh, work that went into building this huge occupied um, area that was uh, for 40 years fighting against the construction of an airport and, and won. Um, but what was very interesting about the Zad is that it wasn't just uh, what the media sort of um, critically referred to as the Zadists, you know, the, the young, mostly young people from urban areas that went there to learn how to be farmers. They were also farmers that have lived there for generations that were participating in this. They were just people that didn't want to leave. So it was this really intense coalition that formed between artists and uh, radical intellectuals and, and, you know, whatever the equivalent of a peasant in northwest France in the 21st century looks like. Um, and so they talk a lot about how they transitioned. They were one of them was an academic, and one of them was a an artist. And and how they transitioned into using aesthetic practices on this territory, which includes um, you know figuring out which trees to cut down and when, and and how to create forms of resistance that actually used the environment in ways that art artists can do. And Ruthie, to to your point, I remember Shaleen once telling me that you and you and her talked about how artists are similar to geographers and that they see in space. And I think this is a very valid point. And maybe one other thing I'll bring up in terms of organization is I just had a very interesting conversation the other night with a friend who organizes with a group called the Bushwick Ayuda de Metuel, uh, Bushwick Mutual Aid. And she talked about how when they first got together, they wanted to do a different type of mutual aid model than that had been kind of present in a lot of places around the city, which is that you collect as much shit as you can then you distribute it. They were like, no, we're going to ask people what they need, and then we're going to procure it. So it's a completely different model, which scales differently, which, which functions differently. But in this sense, they were coming together and figuring out which organizational structure they wanted to take on. And I think you're very right that just because you hate the police doesn't mean you're organized. But I do think that people who, who live together can figure out much better how they're going to do things on the scales that I was talking about, which are much smaller than that of, let's say, like a national trades union, um, without necessarily having to conform to existing um, structures of organization like the party. Um, and in this case, I, you know, if we look at a lot of the unions that, mu um, that museum workers make, uh, and again, I'm really excited that they're doing that. It's awesome. It, it's a form of worker power, no questions asked. Um, but a lot of those uh, museum unions, no matter how small the museum is, they often join really big industrial unions. So we're talking about like auto workers and then like 40 <laughs> kind of 
half freelancers, half museum workers in New York City, and you know they're hanging out with Teamsters, and and it gets it gets complicated. And I just wonder whether that's more important than talking about, hey, the museum I work for just bought another plot of land across the street and just raised the property values by you know two you know twice in one year. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers anything, but it's just what I was thinking about. I don't know if anybody has a question or. Um, hi, thank you both or everybody. Um, I keep on seeing the title of the talk over the shoulder and I'm curious about um, where your consciousness and your practice is on edge, you know? Um, and I'm trying to reconcile the, the, I mean this lovingly friend, you're my, um, the, the biography of, the, of Paris <laughs> with the work that you do with the choir and the, the way that uh, an arts worker or an artist is working between these systems that um, amass on one hand prestige and in the other meaningful organizing, praxis, organize, all these things. And so to me, like, where is, I'm curious with both of you, how um, it feels like in your practices, you do exist in, in, different, in different ways, either in the academy or in arts institutions and then on the street or publishing kind of zines that are translated and distributed kind of um, in radical communities, I don't know. And so I'm, I'm curious, where is, where is the edge and what happens on the edge between both of those places where you, in your work? Um, so this is going to be our, these are gonna be your last comments uh, so that we'll have a little bit of time for a break next just to let you know that um, you should take that opportunity to um, build in whatever else you'd like to say <laughs> as you speak to your friend. I guess, yeah, I like it. I guess uh, my art practice is about being constantly learning. Um, I feel like School, I mean, school is just one little thing, but you, to be in that process of constantly learning, and I feel that my consciousness of the world, of, of my place in it, is always expanding, and that's how I like the title. And, and in that effervescence on the Stop Shop Inquirer, it's always expanding. I'm always like learning more about the world, more about the problems that we need to tackle, more about the experiences of others that I'm, I'm not familiar with, and I guess that's, that's how I understand it. Um, in this constant expansion, always we can, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how to put it, sorry. But uh, it's, yes, that's that process of always learning from others. And my art practice also is trying to do that. Like uh, how, how do I not sit here and repeat a formula every day? You know, that's, there's never a formula. Uh, it's like, I just call it art, but you know what? It's for me the process of continued learning all my life, and that's what, it's a meaningful, exciting life to me. So, I don't know if it answers, but. I'm gonna answer you with a quote from Shaleen, actually, because she's uh, one of my favorite people to talk about this kind of thing. And she tells a story in the first volume of that book that we put out where while she was working at MoMA as an educator, and she was, by the way, one of all of the educators who were fired during COVID, even though they said that nobody was fired, which is bullshit. In any case, she tells a story that while she's there educating, um, the MoMA was starting to make moves towards curating a show about abolition. Meanwhile, like half their board is involved with private prisons. Not half, but like a few people in particular. I'm exaggerating. And Shaleen said this, which I think is great. 
I worked at MoMA at a time when the abolition show was going up. I was working with incarcerated minors all the time. And my very well-meaning liberal immediate supervisor thought it would be a brilliant idea, knowing my politics, for me to sit in on some kind of advisory committee for the abolition show. This was around the time that folks were rallying for Larry Fink, who profits from private prisons off the board, and I didn't want to help with their show of their incarceration. So I refused to be on the committee. And when I spoke with this curator about it, her first response was, but you already work here. And that's the problem. I work here because I pay my bills like this. I'm not a representative of this entity, and I'm not going to do the intellectual work of propping up their show. The idea that our complicity robs us of the ability to say anything is bullshit. And that's kind of the point, right? Like, A, we need to, we need to eat. <laughs> but B, like, there's nothing wrong with wanting to participate in something that produces things that other people enjoy. Just like Fred says, you know, I love the art in there. I got friends in there, whatever, you know? The point is to understand that this line demarcating the, some museum where there's whatever, fame and notoriety and, and value is not the same thing as saying, oh, you know, we like this project and we want to work on it, or we don't, right? So I don't know if that kind of gets at it, but that's one way that I like to think about it. One thing that the strike MoMA terms and frameworks for struggle laid out was that, um, if I think it was point number eight, it said there is no purity in our movement, right? So we're all in, you know, we're, I have a bank account, and sometimes I use that bank account to send money to bail funds. But then the guy who owns that bank account is making money off the destruction of the earth, right? So we're all kind of messed up. But the point is not to not think that that doesn't allow us to do other things, I think. I love that that was the way you closed, because the next panel is called After Authenticity. Um, so clearly this conversation is not over, but the panel is. <laughs> we have about... 10 minutes for coffee and um, herbal iced teas, which are over here at the end of the bar. Our comrade presses, common notions, and uh, autonomia are here with books, um, some of our speakers' books as well. And um, of course, for everyone to continue the conversation. So we'll see you back around here in at Let's shoot for three o'clock. It'll pro three o five is probably when we'll begin. We're shooting to be here at three. <laughs> Peter will shoot you if you're not here by three.
on to another question. <laughs> Are we sitting comfortably or even uncomfortably? Um, actually, uh, well, my name is Peter Hitchcock. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Place, Culture and Politics. And at the moment, I'm feeling sort of positively giddy. And um, it's not the edibles. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know we're live streaming, so I thought I'd do that one for the live stream. Uh, it can here comes the car now. Um, <laughs> no, but it's, it really is a joy, though, to be among uh, comrades and, and colleagues and, and friends. I mean, something that, uh, as Ruthie had mentioned before, the larger family of the CPCP hasn't been able to do for well over, uh, well over two years. So this is uh, um, amazing and uh, inspiring. And I, I hope this... Uh, uh, this next conversation uh, beyond authenticity is in keeping with uh, what you've uh, witnessed or participated in uh, so far. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce the, the, the speakers and um, the format will remain pretty much the same as the, as the, as the first conversation. Um, and we will leave, I hope, enough time for, I think there's going to be plenty of time for for conversation to and fro with the uh, audience. To my uh, uh, immediate right is Jennifer Ponce de Leon, uh, from who teaches at Penn. Um, English, you know, I teach in English, so apologies for that. Um, but better known for her uh, work on uh, Latin American and Latinx studies, um, particularly uh, this uh, book that came, came out last year, uh, the title of which is uh, Another Aesthetics is Possible. Um, you know where that's coming from, I guess. Oh, yeah, right, right here. <laughs> so you're going to take 15% for that one. Um, <laughs> but one of the brilliant things about the, the, the book is that it, it it looks at this uh, relationship between uh, art and activism and activist art, uh, which is very much apropos with uh, not only uh, what we were discussing in the first uh, uh, conversation, but also in the wonderful uh, uh, film showings last night. And thank you again for that. Um, and um, so if, if that book is brilliant, um, our second speaker is no less brilliant uh, uh, in, his, in his own way, Mike Denning who teaches at, uh, at Yale. And I've, uh, I've sort of been nurtured by Mike's work over the years in American studies and, and cultural studies uh, from whether it's discussing uh, dime novels or uh, audio politics. And uh, since I sort of come out of British uh, cultural studies, apologies, apologies. Um, you know, it's... It's, it's good to know that somebody in American studies can do this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, now, I had set them some really hard questions um, in, in order to get this conversation going. You know, what is life? Um, do you pay taxes? Um, apparently, they're, they're not interested in those questions. But I did ask about the, you know, the, the meaning of revolution in, in revolutionary arts. And... Um, also, the place of uh, experimentalism in uh, art uh, artistic practices. And um, Jennifer, in, in her book, had, had used this uh, phrase, uh, contradictory experimentalism. And I, I was thinking about contradiction not just within political economy, but in artistic practice itself. So I'm hoping that that might come up too in our conversations. But Without further ado, uh, let's give a warm welcome to Jennifer and Mike. Uh, Jennifer, are you going first? Okay. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you to the Center for Place, Culture and Politics, to all of the organizers, um, to the People's Forum, and um, to Michael Denning. I'm very it's, I was thrilled to be invited because it's an honor to be part of an event with such wonderful speakers in a place that I really admire. 
um, Mike's work has really influenced my own, so this is just very exciting for me. I was also really happy to be excited uh, to invited because um, the topic really connects to research questions I've pursued for about 20 years. And mo most broadly, these are questions about the role of art, artists, and other intellectuals in class struggles. And I use the term class struggles in the sense that it, um, the broad sense it's given in Marxist thought, where it names a broad array of collective struggles that develop on the material base of the production and distribution of resources and means that ensure life. So more specifically, I have focused my research on art practices, including theater, literature, and visual art that are part of or that are inspired by left movements. So I'm going to outline first some of the concepts that I use to think about the politics of art and then show you some recent art practices that I think help to illuminate these. So my work draws on the rich corpus of Marxist thought that theorizes culture as a site and weapon of class struggle. This body of thought rejects the bourgeois myth that art occupies a realm separate from the rest of the social world, or that it offers an experience of judgment or imagination that is unencumbered by interests that shape people's daily lives. This ideological understanding of art obscures the use ruling classes have always made of art and culture to secure and legitimate their power. So instead, I start with the understanding that because artworks shape humans' consciousness, they are always implicated in ideological struggles that precede and exceed the works of art themselves. So ideology actively shapes human cognition and perception by forging collective worlds of sense that make sense. And by make sense, I mean provide for a practical consciousness that is nonetheless incoherent and contradictory. This is what Antonio Gramsci refers to as common sense when he talks about how we are products of the historical process that has deposited in us an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory. And he juxtaposes this to the need for developing good sense, which is a critical consciousness and coherent understanding of social reality, its contradictions, and the forces affecting its development. And I think that socialist art can cultivate this kind of good sense. Bertolt Brecht described this as helping people to not just see differently, but to see correctly. And he argued that there are myriad formal tactics for doing this, and that they must be chosen or invented based on the needs of the struggle at hand. And in fact, he argues that formal intervention is required because reality is dynamic, and some forms lose their effectiveness as situations change. And this is a political defense of formal experimentation, which is totally different from a formalist approach that you know, fetishizes invention for its own sake, or rather for its utility and kind of marketing new luxury commodities, or that attempts to separate the evaluation of aesthetic form from the question of its utility for political struggle. So Brecht made clear that what is at stake in helping people see, see correctly and understand reality is helping them understand how they should act. So there's a common critique of this argument that consists in asking, what gives the artist or the intellectual the authority to know what is correct? Isn't this saying that the artist has a superior position to their audience? But this critique assumes an individual proprietary understanding of knowledge, which is very much cultivated by liberal ideology and modern regimes of intellectual property. But Marxists, like Brecht, understand that knowledge is collectively produced, as are techniques and forms for its communication. In my own writing and curating, I've argued that some leftist artists are able to contribute more correct analyses of reality precisely because they are part of movements or parties that are generating this knowledge and also creating conditions for it to be received as such. Now, bourgeois ideology also works to isolate individual artworks from the institutionalized structures in which they are produced and to cast artists as paradigmatically free subjects rather than acknowledge their location within class relations and the consequences this has for their practice. This leads to an impoverished and often romantic account of the politics of art, and it also leads to a lack of appreciation of the practical challenges of producing and disseminating revolutionary art in capitalist societies, given that the means of intellectual and cultural production are owned by our class enemies. The expansion of democracy in the 20th century was accompanied not only by the growth of corporate power, but also its concentration over the industrialized means of cultural production. And when we account for this, we can see the forces working to keep intellectuals in what Che Guevara refers to as our invisible cages, 
where we can be showered with honors if we play by the rules of the game. And of course, one of the most consequential ways the cultural apparatus shapes culture is by controlling who, or more, pre more precisely, what classes or class fractions can even access the means of cultural and intellectual production. So the class character of the capitalist cultural apparatus creates practical challenges, challenges for the production and distribution of revolutionary art. And it has also spurred left cultural workers to work to transform the social relations of cultural and intellectual production, distribution, and reception themselves. This takes many forms, including labor struggles and contestation of property regimes within the cultural apparatus, which we were talking about in the previous panel. Um, and in other cases, and I'm going to show some examples of this, cultural workers transform artistic forms or develop alternative means of producing and disseminating art. I think you know, Third Cinema is one of my favorite examples of this. Um, for example, the groups uh, Cine Liberación and Cine de la Base from Argentina devised means to clandestinely produce and disseminate revolutionary films in the context of right-wing dictatorships. And in many cases, um, these films were tools of political communication, um, in some cases for the Revolutionary Party, the um, Ejército Revolucionario del Pueblo. And these uh, film groups also reworked the relations involved in the distribution and reception of their work by, for example, showing their films in union halls and collective kitchens, and also using them as catalysts for political discussions and organizing, which reminds me a lot of this in the conversation we had last night. Um, I also think of Teatro Campesino from California's Central Valley, which was the cultural arm of the United Farm Workers. And they took their collectively authored theatrical works to pickets, protests, and political meetings, using it as a tool for anti-war and labor organizing. And I think the space we're in is also an ex excellent example of alternative cultural infrastructure that supports the production and dissemination of knowledge and culture that has real use value for socialist struggle. So now I want to um, share some examples from my book and my more recent research. And I, these practices exemplify the kind of experimentalism I've been talking about in the ways that they rework extant forms of visual art and theater, and in doing so, even integrate techniques and practices that are considered extraneous to the arts. Um, this is, so I'm going to talk first about two groups from Buenos Aires. Uh, this is an image of Grupo de Arte Callejero, who was naming Street Art Group and goes by the acronym GAC. Um, and et cetera is the other group I'll be speaking about. And both of these groups uh, were formed in the late 90s um, and have used their art to contribute to, among other things, the grassroots human rights movement in Buenos Aires. And I should also note that their practice, like that of many other um, artists working you know, at the, in this time, was very much impacted by the 2001 financial crisis in Argentina, the subsequent popular uprising and flourishing of movements, um, popular movements at that time. Um, now, these two groups you know, came up in the human rights movement which is a movement that started in, um, during the Argentina's most recent dictatorship, and it has really led the demand for justice for the state terrorism that was committed by the right-wing regime that ruled the, ruled the country um, under a military dictatorship from 1976 to 83. Now, the human rights movement is also marked by the contradictions of liberal human rights discourse and practice, which generally promotes a defensive politics of individual rights, effaces the structural violence of exploitation, and condemns the counterviolence of the oppressed. And I'm not just speaking about the movement in Argentina. This is kind of generally about liberal human rights discourse in general. So like any movement, the human rights movement is a site of intense ideological struggle. And in my book, I demonstrate how these art groups that had their beginnings in this movement participate in their ide this ideological struggle in the movement with their art. And they also use their art practices to support movement campaigns using and also updating and um, adapting direct action tactics that were developed by this movement. So for example, this is um, an image um, from a series that GAC has done starting, they done starting in the late 90s. Um, these were called street, series of street signs. And they created um, guerrilla interventions in public spaces that mimicked official street signs and sometimes tourist maps. But these works function as part of exposure protests that are known um, in Argentina as escraches. And these are a tactic that the human rights movement has used to build a social condemnation of state terrorism and its agents. And these are basically forms of organizing in a neighborhood 
to um, expose the identity of somebody who's been in, involved in or complicit with state terrorism, tell everybody about what they did, and to develop a social condemnation of this person. And this is in the context, importantly, this is in a context where there's official impunity for, um, because of amnesties and pardons, there was a, basically a policy of official impunity for the agents of state terrorism. So this was an alternative mean of means of developing a form of popular justice. Um, and again, building a social consensus about what had happened. So Gack's work, like creating these signs that are basically directing protesters to the home of the person who's going to be publicly denounced, are part of like the material organization of these protests. Um, this is another image of one of their images um, that is widely circulated. I think it's also important to note that they have a non-proprietary non relationship to their designs and signage, so others take them up and use them. And this particular design, which means trial and punishment, uh, well, that's what it says, was developed in collaboration with one of the um, human rights organizations and has really kind of become iconic in relationship to the movement in general, precisely because they allow it to freely circulate. Um, and it's been uh, taken up in other ways as well. This is another work, uh, this is a map showing um, people who've been denounced for their complicity in state terrorism, providing their addresses and brief descriptions of what they did. Um, this, well, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, but I also wanted to quickly, quickly note that, so it's Cetera, which is a southern, another, a different group in Buenos Aires, also came up in the movement. They have a very different practice from GAC. Um, but they have created very raucous, often funny, allegorical performances, um, both within escraches and as escraches. And so they use these, um, these performances also an opportunity to interpret the history of state terrorism for their audience, who they also seek to draw into the performances. So through their contributions to movement mobilizations, both of these groups push human rights discourse towards a more comprehensive accounting of violence and its causes. This includes, for example, addressing agents of economic terrorism. This is, a, you know, you can see this sign that's particularly targeting um, the Minister of Economy under the most recent dictatorship. And I should note that oftentimes escraches and these kind of denunciations are targeting military officers, um, sometimes priests who were complicit, but often um, the kind of civilian uh, members, you know, who are people who were complicit are, are not often the most visible kind of agents of this history. So I think this kind of um, work is important in that way. They've also um, denounced a agents, uh, com excuse me, economic beneficiaries of state terrorism, such as local capitalists who benefited from its use as a form of labor discipline and colluded with the repression of labor organizers. This is from a performance that it said that it did in front of the National Fine Arts Museum to denounce one of um, the persons on its kind of board of trustees, who um, basically, you know, fortune is from an industry that was um, uh, a company that uh, had been formally accused of being complicit in the repression of its of, of its workers. Um, but also what I think was important about this performance is that they connected this history of state terrorism as a form of labor discipline happening in the 70s to the kind of current ways that the same industry is destroying the health and the ecology of the place where its mills are located. Um, and so this, and GAC similarly did the same kind of thing with their artistic contributions to protests against this um, corporation and its owners. Um, and these, both of these groups also contribute to a more radical tendency within the human rights movement, which moved, moved beyond a focus on the dictatorship to denounce contemporary police violence as a form of class war. And this is one example where you see Zach, Gak signage circulating in a protest that was about the police killing of leaders of the Piquetero movement or the unemployed workers movement. Um, and I think, you know, this, the signage is also connecting this contemporary history of repression by the liberal democratic bourgeois state to the history of repression by the um, authoritarian uh, dictatorship. Um, now, both of these groups with this work are countering tendencies of post-dictatorial liberal memory culture wherein the memorialization of state violence under dictatorship is used to shore up the legitimacy of the liberal, liberal bourgeois state 
and wherein the focus on extraordinary violence and the trauma it caused includes an understanding of the ongoing class warfare of elites in which state terrorism is just one tactic. And these, um, the kind of critique of the kind of official memory culture at, and the alliance of humane, they, they've even included kind of uh, fi, um, critiques of official memory culture and the alliance that major human rights organizations made with the Kirchner movement in kind of um, institutionalizing that version of memory culture. Um, this is from one of the performances that it said that it did that got them in, um, had them denounced actually by the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo um, in a, before its kind of controversial nature. Um, and I could maybe speak more about that if there's interest. But I, I also, I just want to say, I think that an interpretation of histories of fascism and authoritarianism as an extremely important um, site of ideological struggle in the arts, particularly now, and it's something I've kind of continued to address in my um, more recent work. I won't go into that so much, but I instead wanted to share another example of um, a contemporary practice that is also from Argentina that I believe transforms the relations of cultural pr production as well, and in this case to use visual art and design as a tool um, for militant investigation. Um, this group is called the Iconoclasistas, they were founded in 2006 by Pablo Arres, who was a, gra a graphic designer who was formerly in Grupo de Arte Callejero, and Julia Reisler, who's a professor, researcher, and writer. Um, now, their work combines graphic arts with techniques of social cartography and popular education to contribute to the knowledge production of and for left movements and organizations. Um, they developed a methodology for collective mapping which they've used in workshops held across Latin America as well as in Europe. And each of these workshops addresses an issue salient to each site and hosting organization, including gentrification and the displacement of working class communities, the social and environmental effects of extractive industries, and the living and working conditions faced by informal workers, including um, workers who sort and recycle trash. And I think interestingly, they developed this method um, first to provide to help out a friend of theirs who's a geographer to provide um, um, him and his colleagues with a kind of toolkit in their field research. And then this, they, this was kind of the seed for this um, method that they've then developed and really broadly socialized because they don't only um, hold these workshops, they also have made a manual so that other people can do them. They make all of their designs accessible and freely downloadable and usable. Everything is copyleft. So they also have a real um, uh, part of their practice is the socialization of the tools that they've um, developed. And these workshops use the investigation of space and territory as a means of analyzing class struggles. Typically, participants work in small groups. They're provided with maps of the places that they're investigating and icons and other graphics that um, they can use that the, the artists have developed. And they, using these tools, these visual tools, as well as their own writing and drawing and the various kind of methods that, that have been developed and shared with them, they mark up the maps or create their own maps to represent the spatial manifestations of social conflicts that concern them. Then they share these maps with each other, discuss their findings, and through that collectively produce new analyses about the conflicts being investigated. And this then becomes a basis for planning new steps. So oftentimes the organizers or the participants, sometimes the artists systematize these findings, which may be in the form of a poster or a zine. Um, and the idea is not that this is conceived as a finished work, but rather as a tool for organizing and a point or a point of departure for further investigation. Here's one example. This was, um, it's an English translation of uh, a, a piece they originally produced that is an investigation of the um, soy industry um, in Argentina and the, you know, the various kinds of effects it has from the uh, displacement of smallholders and indigenous people from their land to the public health crises that the fumigation causes. Um, this and this was an earlier kind of um, version of this that they later developed at a larger scale. This is more of a regional look at it's called the Toxic Soy Republic. Um, 
and they develop this, you know, and, and I should, you know, these these are all collaboratively generated works because the people who are, there's lots of different organizations and people participating in these workshops from researchers to, or, you know, organizers, activists, community organizations. Um, this particular, it's unfortunate you can't see the richness of it, but you, it is published online by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation if you want to look into it. Um, and if, just to explain a bit about it, what I think is so interesting is by, it's really showing the relationship between a lot of different phenomena. So it's, for example, mapping, and there's a, a key on the side that shows you, you can kind of to interpret what it, the information there, but it's marking sites of ecocide, sites where communities are suffering from fumigation and the kind of the health crises this has caused, like um, um, extremely high cancer rates. It's also marking land that has been cleared by, um, for industry by arson. Um, people who are being forced from their homes and their land because of the land grabs by transnational companies. So it is really mapping out the kind of um, material connections among these processes and demonstrating that they are really rational consequences of the way that this industry, you know, fueled by transnational finance capital, that this is how it works. Um, and they also identify in this map 66 different organizations that are all involved in resisting these processes from um, organizations involved in indigenous rights, you know, indigenous self-determination, um, to you know, territorial-based organizations, to mothers organi organizing against fumigation, to people involved in food security. So there's a way that kind of mapping, there, I, there's a way that mapping the transnational dimensions of these conflicts is also um, going hand in hand with showing the kind of, um, I would say, need for international response to these, given the scale of, you know, given actually what they're dealing with, and also the kind of possibility or potential for that, given that there are so many that they're also showing you the plethora of people who are actively working um, to resist this. And there's, Marcela Fuentes has written very eloquently about their work in talking about that they zoom in and out um, on these conflicts so you can see both the regional scale and then you even get stories of individual organizations or individual individual people, for example, who died from cancer caused by um, uh, fumigation. So you, this produces a really multi-scalar representation of class struggles that I um, find very compelling and I think is also quite useful. So just in closing, I just want to note that um, in situations where workers' parties have seized control of the state, they've been able to transform the relations of cultural production, I think, in far more wide-ranging and dramatic ways. And we can think here of um, the liter literacy campaigns carried out by the Cuban Revolution or its formidable nationwide cultural infrastructure that democratized culture, broke away from neocolonial cultural domination, and fostered an internationalist revolutionary culture both nationally and around the world. And I think it's important to learn from the cultural policies implemented by socialist states and also recognize the limits to reforming the relations of cultural production within capitalist societies given that these are structured by property relations that capitalists and bourgeois states are very committed to defend, which is just to say that the desire to socialize the cultural apparatus should point us to the primary need for a socialist strategy that would give the working class the power to accomplish this. Michael. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I was a little reluctant to join this panel because I haven't been working on revolutionary arts. So I'm not even sure I could recognize it. And so one of the great things I feel like is having followed four presentations from last night and this morning of people who've shown you actually revolutionary arts taking place in the contemporary moment, it makes it a little easier for me to try to answer the question that Peter asked, that you've both tracked revolutionary arts in terms of activism, aesthetics, history, and politics. Could you begin by drawing on projects you've done that highlight your chief concerns in this? So I'm going to take kind of something, a weird thing, and go back 
make a few thoughts on books that were long ago written and maybe some of you know or don't know. I'll pass them around. Uh, one of them is called The Cultural Front, which was on the 1930s in the United States, and the other is called Noise Uprising. And I just so, uh, and we can pass these around actually for those people who haven't seen them and then think about it. Um, because I found myself immediately translating the rubric revolutionary arts into my own language of social movement cultures and countercultures. And I realized as soon as I did that translation that it actually figured two of the great moments of 20th century radical art. If the first half of the century, the moment of the revolutions in Mexico and Russia, was dominated by an imagination of vanguard parties and avant-garde artists, the moment of the Breton Rivera Trotsky manifesto that's cited in the seminar's call, the second half of the century, that moment of 1968 and its afterlives, was dominated by an imagination of movements and cultures, a different vocabulary. And I guess my own work was decisively shaped by the later moment. In the cultural front, I really reimagined those revolutionary arts of the 1930s as a kind of social movement culture. Um, and in the culture of age and three worlds, I tried to account for the political meanings of that cultural turn, that the kind of arts to culture is a change there. And in Noise Uprising, I reimagined the musical revolution that prophesied decolonization through the ears of someone that had been shaken up by the political musics of the 1960s. And I think in our present moment, both of these vocabularies, revolutionary arts and movement cultures, probably have to be Aufhebungd, however you say the German in English, which is to say preserved, abolished, transcended, surpassed. And hopefully, and I think actually the presentations over the last 24 hours have begun to do that. There's new vocabularies for the new lefts of the 21st century. Um, and I guess I'll let the practicing revolutionary artists invent the new terms that they need. But today, just in the sake of a conversation, let me make two initial observations drawing on my research in radical arts and movement cultures. First, the continuing tension between what I called an early thing, but a lot of other people have come up with this, cultural politics and aesthetic ideologies. Between, on the one hand, the declared intentions of artists, between social consciousness, what the 30s called social significance, sing a song with social significance, uh, and a political unconscious. Uh, and for me, this is actually the difference between those two books. And so this is not really about the books, but the topic. The Cultural Front was really a book largely about artists who symbolically enrolled themselves in the social movements of the left, a social democratic unionism and an electoral politics, an anti-fascist internationalism, and a civil liberties mobilization against lynching and labor repression. Those artists clustered around two distinct generations, a modernist generation that came of age in those revolutionary years of 1917 to 1919, and a plebeian depression generation who were coming of age right there in the years after the crash of 1929. And those were two different experiences in that way. And they occupied positions across four distinct cultural worlds that still somehow resonate with our cultural world a proletarian avant-garde who were self-consciously revolutionary artists and set up all sorts of small groups and theater companies and street companies and singing groups and all of that. The movement cultures of working class education, entertainment, and recreation that were built by unions, mutual benefit lodges, the communist parties, a variety of movement organizations. Third, an exploding New Deal state apparatus 
that provided jobs, temporary and permanent, to artists and intellectuals, ending up in the kind of what I think of as the permanent New Deal Works Project, the public university system that came up <laughs> after the war, right? And fourth, the culture industries of film, radio broadcasting, and sound recording that depended on the labor of these young artists. And as you track individuals, you'll find them moving from one of those worlds to another, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes involuntarily, within, particularly with the Red Scare and the uh, um, driving out of people from the state apparatus and the cultural thing. Noise uprising, in contrast, was less about political artists than apparently apolitical artists. So a different meaning, the subtitle of that was the audio politics of a world musical revolution. A revolution in music that prophesized the anti-colonial revolutions in political sovereignty that followed though the musics were often seen as completely unpolitical. They were just dance musics, after all. They were often musics for tourists, even by the musicians themselves. I argue, and I can talk more about this, a revolution in music. And here the Greek concept is less, I think, revolutionary arts than cultural revolution, the transformation of our listening ears and our dancing body. And this leads me to my second comment here to start the to continue the conversation here, which is thinking about the issue of scale in the concepts of revolution and art. Not scalability, which assumes that one can move from one scale to another, but the radical notion of scale, which is that things are very different at different scales, and it is very hard to move from one scale to another. And to suggest in the spirit of Raymond Williams' famous alternative, oppositional, what was the third one, emergent and residual, which helped some of us at one time but seemed to raise as many questions as it ever answered. Let me give you three moments in cultural politics to confuse and confound you. A moment one, a moment of cultural resistance, the arts of insubordination, the acts of subaltern disrespect, to cultural hierarchies and institutions, often with very ambiguous and contradictory political valences, sometimes coalescing into small subcultures or countercultures, other times remaining not individual even, but kind of monadic gestures of one's own body and clothing. Indeed, the so-called social media, what a terrible word for that, has actually allowed the amplification and proliferation of these symbolic acts that we see all around us. Another entire level, the moment of the struggle for cultural justice, cultural politics in the ordinary sense, conducted within and against the apparatuses of culture the universities, the galleries, the museums, even the television studios, apparently. This is the work of cultural bureaucrats like myself. It does, I'm not too insubordinate these days. A continual war of position on the cultural front, a contradictory struggle to build some kind of democratic cultural commons, reshaping histories, reshaping canons, changing the entrance and, uh, and, uh, and access to these institutions, yet always entangled with the fact that there is privileged access to unequal and unjust institutions and where one never really knows whether those struggles for cultural justice are winning, losing, relevant, irrelevant. And a third moment that I think we have to forget not cannot forget and yet must remain sort of humble in that is the moment of cultural revolution. The remaking of ways of living, of symbolic structures, the invention of new media and new genres, new ways of living and adorning our bodies and our buildings, the formation of an entire new conception of the world. That was Gramsci's term, a kind of weird and not very successful word at one way. A new reformation was another way that he saw it there. I think this is the hardest to recognize. Sometimes the cultural bureaucrats struggling for cultural justice are unable 
to imagine the full dimensions of a cultural revolution. And sometimes those who imagine a truly new sound or a new vision are themselves tied to received oppressions and accepted hierarchies and end up looking like reactionary artists, even though they're showing us the way. So that's one way of maybe thinking about and opening this up. I knew when I asked uh, very innocent questions that, that Jennifer and Mike were not going to leave these alone. And that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. I, uh, would it be wrong to uh, ask you perhaps to respond to each other's um, uh, approach to the, the, the questions that we put on the, the table? Because I, I do think you have, I mean, there, there are definitely points of connectivity between the two, but I, I also think that there's perhaps a, a measure of the historical distance that Mike was indicating in consigning his work to uh, the, the what is it the dustbin of history that that actually uh, that actually is still fecund right and still actually speaks to um, what you're attempting in in your research. So a few minutes on that, and then we'll still have plenty of time to uh, take questions from the audience. Sure. I mean, I can. I and I usually just say, I mean the. Um, cultural front really influenced my work as you know Michael did directly so I, I see it as a extremely relevant um, relevant to now I was I was really compelled um, among other things that you said by the distinction that you made between revolutionary arts and cultural revolution and I think that's an important distinction to make because um, just and I'm thinking of um, some of my own preoccupations and experience in, in um, trying to work through these questions is that sometimes when we start with art um, and to see what art can do, we're often starting with this very restrictive notion of what art is, which, you know, the kind of bourgeois colonial concept of art that's developed within the exhibitionary apparatus and that, you know, you know, frankly, because of the class position that intellectuals occupy, oftentimes that is the art that we are exposed to, you know, uh, that we like, that we've lived with. And so starting with art and then getting to, to the question of politics um, sometimes pushes us in the direction of saying, okay, well, what does this, this in fact, very restricted notion of what counts as art, um, how does that get us there? And that... It can oftentimes lead to, well, I mean, it leads to um, a lot of the practical problems that we've talked about, like that these are, you know, products of ruling class institutions, luxury commodities, et cetera, um, that are also have that have also been, you know, profoundly um, mystified and mythified in their potential effect that they might have upon the world which is quite different from, I think, the question of cultural revolution, which is a much broader purview of what we might be thinking about and where we might be looking to the sources of, you know, what would transform human consciousness or transform our, you know, which I, and I really liked what you said about transforming how we hear, transforming how we dance, that this is a, you know, cultural revolution is, is um, involves, a, you know, consciousness and also transforming, for transforming our sensory apparatus, right? Um, and it seems like that question, when we frame it that way, rather than starting with art in its restrictive sense, then opens up a lot of other types of places we might look and that we need to look, um, including a lot of things that would never be, you know, considered art from the kind of restricted bourgeois sense of it, right? Um, so I, I, I find it kind of an important distinction to make. Um, and I say that also because just, you know, my own kind of training as an intellectual, right, um, there's that these kinds of practices, like popular practices, are, are, you know, very sharply distinguished from the research and the history of bourgeois art practices. So we're also, you know, taught to only, to, to not see these as um, communicating fields, right? So I really appreciated that the, the way that you open that question up. Oh, okay, there. Is that on? Yep. Yes. Uh, 
Let me say two things on what you said. One is what I, and it was not only your talk, but the two earlier uh, this afternoon. I'm very interested in thinking about when we live exactly. You know, are we in the moment after 1917? Are we in the moment after 1968? For a long time, I thought we were in the moment after 1994 and the kind of Zapatistas and the global justice movements that emerged and, and many of the figures in, the, in your book that come out of that. It also seems like there is yet a new left in the wake of 2008, in the wake of that crash in Occupy and Black Lives Matter in Me Too. And, uh, and each of these moments is creating different kinds of new political aesthetics and new kinds of cultural politics. And even to be able to recognize them and both, I think, uh, understand the links to past movements, but to see the differences, that this is not just the same version of this over again, I think is a crucial thing. And so that's why I think one of the important things, maybe why I felt inadequate coming in, is I think one of the purposes that critics need to have is some finger on the pulse of those new things, to recognize what's new and be able to ex share it, explain it, critique it, talk back to it, or whatever. The other thought I wanted to say was really, uh, and it's actually come up, I forget which discussion before, we've long been caught in a kind of uh, question of sort of the relative merits of the cognitive and the aesthetic or something. And what I was very taken is your redefinition of ideology as, I don't have the exact sentence, a world of sense and making senses. And the use of sense in the kind of double way of both uh, approaching the aesthetic and the feeling and that sort of senses and the sensual, and yet on the other hand, reminding us with Gramsci that sense is also a about meanings and the common sense and goodness sense of meanings, that that strikes me a very powerful way for us to be thinking across that divide about whether or not this is just about feelings or something, or whether it has to be correct ideas in a kind of more cognitive way of thinking. Yeah, I was wondering if I could add to that. Um, because, you know, Marx also talks about the formation of the five senses, right? Um, and that reminds me of another little footnote that we might make about uh, Raymond Williams uh, on the idea of the long revolution, right? That we tend to think of revolution as uh, singular, uh, singular events. And um, uh, Williams was also thinking about the temporality of those events, not as a series, but as... Um, moments that would interrupt each other in the cause of uh, expanding the possibility of, uh, uh, of transformation. So, you know, when, although um, you were very self-effacing in discussing your earlier work, Mike, I do think it's really important to um, uh, keep a sense of the lineaments that link the events that you're talking about, uh, these possibilities of political change to current contingencies. and. I don't know whether it's right to call it the the ever newer left or something like that. I think uh, I think but, we may have to be a little bit more creative. But but I but I do I, I do understand what you're saying. But the, it it doesn't seem like the um, the divide is necessarily a division. Is that that's what I wanted to say? Could I just add on that? Because the, the same summer when Marx was I forget whether it was 1843 or 44 was wrote those passages that the making of the five senses was the labor of all history. And you'll remember then he goes on to sort of say that uh, the development of an ear for music is the evolution of the entire species in some kind of way. It's very powerful. That's the same year that he first recognizes the social movement by hearing it in song, that the first great essay that Marx writes about the social movement, and those are his words for it, is about the Silesian weavers' protest through the song of the weavers. And he says in a way, it's fascinating kind, I don't have, I should have brought the whole quote, but it's fascinating, he says, this was a form of theory. It was not that he interprets it as a protest or whatever, that they are theorizing their situation by singing the song. And it's actually that same summer 
when Frederick Douglass is writing in his narrative of trying to understand, remembering back as a child to the enslaved people marching to the plantation to get the monthly rations and singing. And again, he says, I don't understand it at the time. And a philosopher, there's more than any philosopher could be in what was those songs. And he also hears the social movement first in song in some kind of way, is able to recognize it in song. And so I think there is a kind of, this is a kind of contribution to this morning singing and song one that was made me think of that, of the power of the prophetic notion of these arts uh, in social movements in general. Maybe a good moment to transition to uh, questions from the audience, um, which can be asked in a formal way or even sung. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go in for the song. No, uh, this is uh, um, first an appreciation of this panel. It's brilliant, and uh, the energy is great. Let's just start there. Um, and this really follows, um, I, w I, I wasn't planning to follow uh, this last uh, bit, but um, I think it really relates to it, this idea of, of uh, art as, as theory of social movement in the social movement. And I think um, coming back to, I want to come back to et cetera's practice and the work of the art collective or the kind of, uh, the collective within the movement context, the collective that is part of the movement, but not representative of the movement as a whole. Because I think something that I'd like to think more about with you is like, what is the role of the artist within this context of a, of a movement when the movement, as we know, is not like a uniform, like well understood thing, but always a site of struggle within itself. Like the cops are part of the movement. Right, we've got to struggle within the movement to determine what the, what the movement means. At least this is how my collective, uh, not an alternative, um, thinks of uh, our participation as cultural producers within social movements. And, and I believe that et cetera, as uh, comrades, I, I engage with it in a very similar way. So, as collectives working within movements to analyze and to push for an interpretation of the movement that pushes it in a more radical direction or that pushes it towards more revolutionary ends, then it may already be uh, uh, sort of conceived of by the majority, say. Um, and so I want to uh, like invite you to think more, uh, talk more about what is the role of the artist as a kind of like a narrator of the movement in the movement via signs, symbols, et cetera, right? Um, uh, but also this question that uh, Mike raised as well, which is how present movement relates to, say, the past. Because the way that artists who are engaging with, say, visual signifiers within movements engage with them, they, don't, they aren't making them up from scratch, right? You're drawing on the past in order to show a relationship, not just to uh, other struggles here and now, right, or other struggles elsewhere and now, but also the struggles that we're building on, right? So it's not coming from scratch. We've got, you know, in a sense, we have our ancestors that are with us, and that gives us power. Um, and I think um, this is, again, just an invitation to think about narrative and how artists are, like how revolutionary artists, artists who are working towards revolution, are thinking about and engaging uh, with their role as part of, but not uh, indistinguishable from the movement. Thanks. Hi, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask because I sort of uh, I'm a curator and art historian, I, and I sort of work uh, uh, with contemporary artists. And I noticed when I when you were like presenting your work, I, w I kind of noticed how I'm writing notes down and I'm planning my next project, which will be a biennial in Europe, and how I'm going to invite these people 
who you kind of mentioned to this biennial. And I know what will happen then, you know, then it's very often what happens is that some um, art gallery notices these artists and they will actually invite them to be represented by their, by their gallery. So I'm just sort of like thinking about like, how do we deal with these questions of like tokenization? And you know, what actually happening is that, that like, uh, we are, that art world is actually extracting this labor of collective uh, movement in South America to this like global uh, neolib neoliberal network of, um, you know, of art world or institutions, etc. Western institution especially. So I mean, like my question is like, how do we kind of like prevent or like how do we deal with these sort of like uh, <laughs> with these practices of tokenization, value extraction that um, unfortunately, as soon as these, and also there's another another aspect of uh, to this that basically if you have these, you mentioned these uh, practices that sort of exist in Argentina under dictatorship, but. I'm just thinking, okay, if we have this sort of practices in somewhere in Bushwick, you know, we have these boards in Bushwick, they will become like a part of a local um, sort of, you know, like it, it becomes part of gentrification processes, etc. because people will go to visit this part of town to sort of see this work by this like revolutionary artist, you know, and that kind of uh, raises the rents because the area is getting gentrified, etc. So for me, is this is this is kind of something that I'm trying to resolve as a curator and art historian. How do actually we can um, redistribute this value? How can we redistribute this value value that the art institutions and uh, commercial artwork is trying, art world is trying to basically, uh, yeah, suck out or extract? Yeah, sorry. anybody else wants to ask a question. <laughs> it's like the House of Commons, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> no? <laughs> yes. Sorry, I'm the entertainer. It's OK. Um, so I, I want to bridge the conversation that we've just had in the last panel with this one, if possible, or to bring in a question from there that I think you're in a great position to help us understand, too. Um, so. Uh, part of what you spoke about was, um, or the earlier panel spoke about, was an organizational form, or acquires an organizational form that uh, through modernism um, can have an inside and outside, or modernism as a way of describing an organization as having an inside and an outside. And that, in, in a way, the crisis is um, when we try to articulate the the demands, the organizational demands that this condition creates. Um, this crisis prompts how to bridge or relate to a movement um, in that moment of being demanded to demand something. Uh, and you you brought up um, strike MoMA as uh, not creating demands, or even uh, Occupy Wall Street again not articulating demands. So this, um, I would think of as a, a radical openness, uh, a radical openness that allows us to hear, see, feel things that we hadn't felt before because that openness wasn't there before at some point or had been closed through, say, a demand or an articulation. Um, so that's what I'm bringing from the last panel. And what I want to kind of present to you from what I've heard is a lot of these, uh, let's say, um, arts of revolution um, respond to the moment. Um, but they respond to the moment through relations or structures that are have a longer duration than that before colonization, for example, or through revolution, say, or um, coming out of enslavement through singing, uh, 
and 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 looking for liberty or or, or seeking the liberty within what I, I guess I'm 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 referring to singing mostly, and this kind of singing has a sacred quality to it, um, or um, occult uh, value, and. I want, I think I'm hearing a lot about exchange value in a way, like the communication and the ways in which these arts are mediated through um, through a sort of, uh, through an industry. But I, I'll, I'll, could you speak to the cult value of the arts and the artists in a movement, let's say, to speak to, um, that can that can tie tie us back to a longer duration, say to um, indigenous movements, um, and and here uh, I guess uh, it would help to have an example of an opposition: the Green New Deal and the Red Deal, and the differences there. Um, to speak to a, a revolution that does not concretize or does not close um, relations that that can be bigger. I have also a quick question. Um, the cover of your book, is that Papas Fritas? Ah, okay. Uh, just wanted to be sure. Uh, that's an artist who is very prolific, very interesting. And uh, among other things, he um, went inside the university and stole all the paperwork of the student debt and burned it and present the ashes. And uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit, maybe if you could talk about direct action also. Thank you. Now I have 30 seconds to answer all of those questions. Thank you so much for all these wonderful questions. OK, I'm going to start with some and, and then. Um, I think, OK, about the question of the role of artists and movements or revolutionary artists and movements, um, I think it's hard to generalize because when we think about what we bring to movements, um, you know, you have to ask questions of, well, what do I have to offer? What do I need to learn to contribute effectively to this movement as well? Because um, I don't think it always works just to say, well, you know, this is the thing I like to do, so it necessarily must be useful for this movement that I care about. That oftentimes isn't the case, in fact. Um, and oftentimes contributing usefully to movements requires us to learn a lot of other things we didn't know, be it skills and also analysis, right? Um, so I think that question, we always have to ask that. And also artists have a lot of different kinds of things to contribute to movements. I mean, I think one thing, if you think about art as a kind of, let's say, repository of techniques and forms that allows for a really you know, broad and effective forms of communicating the kind of breadth of human, human experience, right? There's a lot of ways that you know, people have different skills within that and that that can be brought to bear in different ways on movements. Be it to, I mean, I think the I like to um, uh, provide the joy or to provide an analysis. It depends, I think, on the circumstance. But I also think there's the question of where one can exercise, where one has leverage within a particular struggle, right, um, is another question to ask. And that, that I was thinking of that um, because of the, uh, we had just had a great conversation about the um, struggle uh, for tenants' rights and the struggle over gentrification in uh, LA. And there was a really, I mean, some of you might be familiar with this, we're, there is a really um, well known, I, I think it was pretty highly publicized, struggle around galleries in Boyle Heights in LA. And the, um, that particular campaign was successful and it was based you know on people thinking where we have power where we actually have leverage in regard to the gentrification of this neighborhood and so they boycotted these galleries and it wasn't necessarily because the galleries are actually the main force in gentrification you know they're often not we're talking about you know development lobbies we're talking about finance capital you know, real estate power those are the real forces um but in this particular case, the um, people who were organizing were able to exercise leverage by boycotting these galleries. And that is, I think, another really important question to ask. Like, what do I have to offer and where can I, you know, um, effectively 
um, intervene. Um, and I think that, <clears throat> and th so I think that that's one, I think, instance of a very successful campaign that was based on thinking of where people um, could effectively intervene. Around um, the question of tokenization and gentrification, uh, tokenization, I, that's, I mean, a, uh, a great question. And I, I, I just want to say, you know, it's a, it's, it's not, it's something where I, I really try to avoid the kind of quick um, dichotomizations of like, okay, or you sell out if you are in a biennial or you sell, I mean, people have to get paid for, unless you're, you know, just rich, like most artists have to somehow um, figure out whether they're going to have a practice that they commercialize or have another job on the side to have a non-commercial, you know, non-commodifiable art practice. Mm -hmm. So I think there's um, real, you know, that kind of reality that we have to look at, um, as well as the reality that some of this work circulates because it, like, circulates in um, publications and exhibitions, et cetera. You know, I, that's how I learned about some of these works. So um, for me, it's not a matter of saying, well, we avoid these, you know, the resources that the cultural apparatus offers us, because in some cases that might be the right judgment to make, depending on what you're being asked to do and the compromises. But in other cases, you know, there's a kind of, um, it offers the possibility to communicate with people or to disseminate ideas. And so there's a lot of uh, cunning sometimes that has to be involved in figuring out how to most effectively use those spaces. Um, and I'm thinking of, you know, of, of uh, and, and I should also say that the kind of relationships within a cultural apparatus, the labor relations that are involved, also um, set the conditions for um, what can be kind of, what can be communicated in those spaces. Do you know what I mean? Oftentimes the sort of tokenization or the overriding of radical art within these kind of spaces has a lot to do with the fact that art workers have very little power oftentimes within, um, you know, within the cultural apparatus. So, um, but I, you know, I think there's plenty of examples of artists who use the, those resources and are able to um, nonetheless um, communicate effectively, or in some cases even use those resources and divert them elsewhere. I mean, I've, one of the practices I write about is um, an artist who's originally from Mexico but now lives in New York who takes took a commission for a work, used a part of it to buy 100 kilos of Zapatista coffee, and part of the artwork you know, created a pop-up coffee shop that was in the festival that was basically participating in a solidarity economy that supported Zapatista coffee producers. So that's just, you know, it's kind of one instance of um, thinking of how one might work with that within the apparatus, but also use the resources that it is um, offering to and divert those in a meaningful way. Um, about the um, question of the list of the radical openness and the cult. Um, I think demands are fine and I think they're useful. So I'm, you know, I, I don't particularly, I, I don't, I, I don't know really what is, um, you know, offered by the idea of, of not having them. I, and I really think, you know, honestly, like the legacy of Occupy should be something like what happened to Occupy to me was a really important lesson in the need for a strong organization. So it's not, I don't think, the kind of historical example I think I would follow in saying that is, you know, the way that we should be organizing going forward because I don't think it proved to be that successful. Um, even if it was very successful in, um, I think, raising the consciousness of a lot of people, giving people, bringing a lot of people in, giving people, uh, you know, um, political education in terms of power, really shifting the balance of class forces, I wouldn't say that a lack of demands um, was particularly a good strategy. Um, or the kind of, I mean, that's a, a longer uh, conversation. About the cult value of art, I don't find that also to be a kind of, that, that useful light of an idea for the same reason that I was saying that, um, and I, may, I might be misunderstanding pre precisely what you were talking about, but I'm, I was thinking when you were talking about the way that, you know, 
a lot of people argue that sort of art in the kind of sense, bourgeois sense, has kind of replaced replaces religion in, in the modern world in terms of the what we think about and kind of mystifications and hopes that we deposit in it. And for the same reasons, I think, you know, religion doesn't help us figure out the realities of how the world works. I, I kind of, I don't find sort of that type of mystification or I guess ideal, idealist thinking to be as useful. Um, and regard to uh, Papas Fritas, and I'm glad you asked about uh, his work, because one of the things that was interesting, so the, the picture that um, uh, is on the cover of my book, is, it was uh, from a series of paintings. He, he produces <clears throat> um, editions of paintings, and these ones he was selling to raise money to support the Primera Linea, the, like the front line of protesters in the um, big mobilizations that happened in Chile in 2019, no? So this was, uh, you know, art practice that was really fundraising to support direct action at a moment that was really consequential. And I thought, this is such a, co co it was so coherent with the kind of, um, you know, the way that his, that his work is also um, waging a certain kind of ideological struggle. But again, here's another example of an artist who's like materially using like the, the way that his art might be sold to support this struggle. Um, so in any case, I think I might end there and I can, you know, if there's more, I can, more questions I didn't answer. I'll come back. <laughs> I think you answered all of them, but I'll make yeah, two, yeah. two comments. And um, one, I guess, on, on, um, one on abstraction and one on organization. You know, labor is something that exists and doesn't exist, remember? You know, on the one hand, we know it exists. It's, we're working all the time. And on the other hand, it is this remarkable abstraction that Marx claims wasn't really seen until Adam Smith that equated all kinds of completely different human activities. And because they all got paid X per dollar, so much dollars and cents an hour, they were interchangeable, even though the activities were completely different. And this remains something even to this day and age when all kinds of activities that people didn't think were exactly labor turn out to be labor. And in fact, teaching labor is one of those. There's been a battle over the in my lifetime. And caring labor is another one. Art labor is another one. And those whole questions. And there's a kind of double entity that you don't really necessarily want to be brought into the exchange world of labor. On the other hand, you are necessarily brought into that. And I feel like the word art is a not dissimilar one that it is inescapable. I don't want to give up on that word. Yet just from what we've seen, that the human activities of making the films that we saw last night or singing together or, or putting up that sign are completely different kinds of activities with very different skills. And it does always remind me that uh, a radical vision of the arts would remember that very different kinds of skills that are involved in those. Uh, and I find myself, indeed, I, uh, even in my own household, there's someone else who's much more attentive to the visual kinds of things. And like me, I'm happy to walk around the world with my eyes closed just listening to the sounds. I'm on that singing side of that. It's audio politics. And it, and it struck me the different kinds of issues that are even raised. Uh, between the kind of material conditions, the different access to means of production, and even in the sound making things, the difference between the various political ideologies around um, singing and singing collectively and singing and echoing those long church traditions of singing collectively and the very different kind of, um, I rarely open my mouth when I'm singing, when you're actually touching that instrument and trying to get some kinds of musical sounds out of, of some wood and steel strings is a different kind of element than that. And it goes together. When it does go together, it's remarkable. But the whole difference between instrumental music and singing music, between music for listening to and music for dancing, where the musicians may not even, they're just kind of a, a, an excuse for the rest of the people to dance along. Uh, and what happens, I, you know, in my earliest senses, you know, for me, the entire entry into the music world was 
between the kind of battles between those people who on the demonstrations wanted to hear Seeger and Solidarity and then went home and danced to Motown or argued about whether or not Dylan should have gone electric. Those all seem totally crazy questions to you, but they're still the questions that are powerful about what kinds of, what things actually count as political. And do you separate the stuff that you kind of like in your spare time, but doesn't look political from the stuff that you respect, but you're not singing at home or something like that. So that's a, a one, that's number one. Number two on organization, and here I'll just throw out something, you know, this is just self-publicity. I wrote a piece recently on Gramsci's theory of politics because I always felt like we really do need new political thinking and taking up a fascinating kind of argument that he makes that everyone is a legislator and to think that actually politics doesn't start from thinking about sovereignty and the state and parties and those kinds of actually the classic things of political science but that Gramsci, just as Marx was not an economist, but the critique of political economy, Gramsci is not a political scientist, but a critique of political science and goes back to first principles of how one thinks about the way in which politics, the way in which we relate to each other. And has this, I can't do the whole thing today, but I'll I, to go read it. I think it's fascinating. But one of the arguments is really that each of us in, in public, uh, this is the quick version, that just as you remember, you've been taught all of this or whatever, he had this great sense that we are all intellectuals even though only some of us have the social function of being intellectuals and are paid for that. He says the same thing is true of legislators. Only some of us are paid to be legislators and are state bureaucrats, whether you're on the Board of Education or running the, in the Congress. But all of us are legislators in the way in which we both uh, conduct norms of conduct, sometimes obeying orders, is conducting norms of conduct because everyone around us, every time we give an exam or a syllabus, we are actually legislating for our students in the school. And I'm sure that those who work in museums or whatever. And they're a very powerful way of rethinking how political activity might link the worlds of work and politics that often seem so different in that way. Uh, it's just a different kind of way of thinking and that actually a notion of organizing is not, or, or rather the, the issue of an organic intellectual is an organizing intellectual and that organizations are kind of the product of a process of organizing that each of us, as we legislate, even in the arts or in education or whatever, are thereby organizing uh, sensibilities, uh, ways of living, ways, norms of conduct. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, in the, there are readers of uh, romanticism who uh, think of that uh, revolutionary idea that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, right? Um, would probably listen quite, you know, with with a smile to what you were just saying there. But I do think that this actually gets us to think about the the uh, the forms of the political and the scale of the political. Right, that even if one does not begin with a consciousness of that positioning, um, it it doesn't mean that you're, you're necessarily outside the uh, production of a politics within it. Um, we have time for more questions, folks. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. This panel has been fantastic. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, uh, Jennifer, you raised the that fantastic and interesting and really challenging quote from Brecht about um, it not simply being about seeing differently, but about seeing correctly. And I, I was interested in both of your thoughts on this because um, on the one hand, we can say, you know, the very aspects of artistic practice and cultural practice more generally that makes it so um, expansive and so full of possibilities for um, reaching across ways of thinking and breaking people into new approaches 
also can tend itself to um, uh, a, a variety of interpretations such that, you know, the you're trying to organize a particular political strategy and unless e even if you're laying out your political line in the art, even if you're committing the big sin of being didactic, people interpret things uh, based on circumstances that make sense to them. And sometimes that leads to some pretty divergent political strategies uh, coming out of them, like forms of consciousness that see the world changing in very different ways. Um, and on the one hand, we can say that that's unique to artistic practice, but any of us who've, you know, whether you've just done research or whether you've just done political organizing, you can spend hours and hours and hours having a conversation with someone laying out a political line, and then you find that their interpretation of it is just as different as if you had done it through dance entirely. So I'm sort of uh, intrigued to hear how you think about this um, uh, tension between or, or productive contradiction between uh, the the expansiveness and the um, bringing together organizationally in precision or 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 with uh, the sort of force that is required by organization to actually have its effect um, and and where you see uh, how you think about that relationship within art and culture. Thanks. Thanks both for uh, more provocation. This is great. Can we convene tomorrow and really duke it out? <laughs> uh, there's a lot to be said. I'm picking up on, on where Patrick just left us, um, I, I'd be curious to know if you, Jennifer, imagine that Brecht thought correct was a very particular, precise an enclosed category, and that's an all a leading way of saying I doubt it, and I also think that you doubt it. So the the question of seeing differently is, um, I think, uh, connects with what Mike is saying about our need to recognize organization by perhaps revisiting some theoretical um, insights. Uh, from the 20th century or from the 19th century or whenever and bring them forward to the 21st century. And yeah, I think we actually saw that already in the presentation you gave us, Jennifer. And that kind of work is happening all over the world, as I think you know. And I was um, reminded in particular of the kind of work that's grown up and, and continues to flourish um, in Appalachia at the Highlander Center which kind of started out with anti-lynching people who also did a lot of music and was kind of congealed through ethnomusicology and, and training in direct action and then flourished as organizations that were the foundation of social movement. So I say all these things to, say, to ask everybody, including the first panel and people who are talking later, is the new that we need actually new? Or is there some kind of refreshment that we need to get our rehearsals back on track? I, I feel like you know we're rehearsing it, we're rehearsing it, and keep tripping over things. And I wonder, quite seriously, heart, serious as a heart attack, whether new is the word we need. Fresh, yes. <laughs> Are you going to ask questions? There's another one back here. Jack him up. Hey, thanks. I really appreciate both of those questions. And they actually sort of asked the question that I was going to ask in a more direct way. Mine sort of stinks of the incense of metaphysics. So, um, but as an unacknowledged legislator of the world, as a poet, um, I'm just wondering. Like, I worry about the the idea of art as theory um, independently of uh, movements, right? And I'm just wondering, like, especially with the stuff that you were talking about with the Silesian weavers and the idea of uh, aesthetics or modes of sensibility as ways of theorizing avant la lettre, whether or not that means that arts modes of theorizing themselves are also liable to the kinds of critique that theory 
should be liable to, whether this correctness is something that can be evaluated with the same standards of rational judgment that, you know, the modes of thinking that concretely are required by politics um, are also liable to. So yeah, just whether art actually does think politically by itself when it does theorize politically by itself, or whether, and if so, whether it has to be reducible to a standard of correctness in that sense. I, I just I just need to put a, a PS. The title of this conference is not revolutionary art. It's re revolutionary arts. And that means any art of revolution rather than art artist practice. And that might be helpful as we discuss things for the rest of the day. <laughs> can, I, can I say one thing? It's not a question. I just wanted to say in response to some of these questions about time and, and where we're at, there's a uh, Giovanni Arighi quote that my friend always recites to me, which is that something along the lines of 1871 was practice for 1917. And then he asks, what was 1968 practice for? And I think a lot of people at a certain time thought that 1968 was practice for Occupy, but I'm not so sure. I actually think that it was practice for what's been happening since 2019 in Hong Kong, in Chile, in, in Haiti, and then all the way through the George Floyd rebellions. And I think that we see alternate forms of organization there that don't correspond to models from the 20th century that I think those kids <laughs> think are perhaps obsolete. Yeah. Fair point. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me take that out. Because, you know, musicians, well, and other artists of different kinds, use practice in that other weird way, like you practice in order to do something later on. And it's that double sense of time, which is there, I would say, also in that question of uh, to what degree any forms of arts could be prophetic of social change. And I, it's an argument that I want to stand behind in lots of ways. And I know it's a controversial one. I think it's not an argument that every any prophet is at true. There are a lot of false prophets out there. And indeed, we may be false prophets in some way. But I do think that, if, uh, particularly from a historian, there, and there may be unexpected ones who were the prophets of what takes place. But I think it is there is a way in which it is, one can see, in some sense, that the first coalescing you know, Atali in his book Noise basically said it in the kind of way that uh, these are a form where other forms of human relations can be tried out in a more cost-free way in a certain sense, and that some of those then may actually echo and resonate later on. And in that sense, whether it is in a kind of musical group or one sense or another, which gives some illusion of a different way of living together, not always the most democratic way. It's arguable that the big bands with their leaders indeed led to a certain kind of populism in post-colonial states. And there's some really good ethnomusicology that looks at the way in which the, the sort of big man in the big band led to a kind of politics of that. But nonetheless, it was an anti-colonial uh, uh, practice. So I think that that sense of, of the ways of living together might be, whether it's in poetry or in narrative fiction or in the theater or in images or in singing together uh, gets projected. The second, I had three quick ones, I'll say. Uh, on the past or whatever, what was it that you wanted, Ruthie? It was not that you don't like, uh, well, I forget what you didn't like, but I'll say it's all dead labor. Revivification is what it is. That this stuff is dead labor, and it does it remains dead unless it is revivified by living labor, and that's why I think still our relation to the past. These are the tools and the instruments and the heritage. It is the na it is the second nature we inherit. But if it's as long as it is inert or whatever, then it just disappears. It decays. It falls apart, and it has to be brought back in that moment of emergency emergency in a new way. And that's what all work in some kind of way is. That's how I, I know I'm a very book-oriented person. When I look at those libraries, we have one in New Haven, which is wonderful, because all these ancient books 
are there under behind glass and you can see stacks and stacks. I'll never forget when I first arrived in graduate school looking at it and thinking, oh, I might add two more volumes that will then rot along with those other ones there. But unless there are 10,000 people going to those libraries, rereading them, rewriting them, revivifying them with living labor, it's just a lot of paper and ink. Um, third point. Did you get your books back, by the way? Oh, no, I'm sure I will eventually. You know, we are in the people's forum. And They're heading to the Yale well, Library as we speak. To the, yes. Uh, no, I'll hold off on the last one. I'll let you take that. Um, thank you. I was, so to the question of um, the ambiguity, the kind of tension about between the ambiguity of uh, art and the need for sort of clarity around tactics or strategy, and I think that, I see that as kind of relating to um, what you said, Ruthie, about is um, the correct, a uh, closed category. And um, I, I would say, okay, a couple of things. I would say, you know, the, um, I think of art's capacities as actually, not, um, I think it's often used to uh, create ambiguity, but I don't think that is necessarily what it needs to be used for. I think it actually, um, is offers, like I said, a whole plethora of um, techniques to communicate with people. And I think it's more a matter of a kind of commitment to try to actually communicate with people something that is useful to people um, rather than, you know, proliferate obscurantism, which a lot of, frankly, art does, just like a lot of intellectual production does as well. So, um, I, but I think that you know, because I wouldn't say that necessarily like an expository essay I would write would be more effective at communicating a line than, you know, a really effectively done film or performance or song. Like, I think it really, there's not a kind of medium specificity to what communicates, but it is more of a kind of commitment to using art in that way, I think, is what it's at stake. And um, in regard to the question, of, and, and I just wanted to connect it to the thing of not just seeing differently, but seeing correctly, I really particularly like that line because, you know, I there's a, a lot of um, claims that just seeing differently itself is political, right? And that is, and I was trained in that kind of stuff too, I've, I'm, you know, but it is a way, I think, oftentimes of, trying to take maybe things we like and say that they're political, um, which you know we don't have to do. We can just say there's things I like for other reasons without saying that this is the thing that's going to tell us you know, that it has a political meaning or it's useful. Those are sometimes really important distinctions um, to make. But, I, but it, I, I don't think that seen correctly is a closed category, but rather it's a way of saying that there again, there is a commitment to collectively developing the correct analysis, and that's what we're trying to do. And again, as I, I think that has to be a collective process, right? Um, and then I think that the question is, new the word we need? I mean, I don't think so. I actually think that, um, what I mean by saying I don't think so is I think that there's sometimes a kind of, uh, and, by, and I mean particularly in the kind of political culture of the US or um, a, a just automatic reflex to, to say that, um, we need new forms that, um, I, and I'm saying that because I was, I think, exposed to that, very much believed that for a long time, but uh, that was also coming out, in my case, quite frankly, of an ignorance about the real past effectiveness of um, earlier forms, like parties, right? I just kind of was indoctrinated into a sort of political culture that assumed that all left forms of organizing that we've had in the past are, you know, are bad, are wrong, or lead to, you know, and, and, and I've kind of, I think, really reevaluated that position and understood that some of those um, conclusions, which, again, I was just, uh, you know, oftentimes were just things I received, were actually in some ways part of decades of reaction against uh, left organizing and left thinking. Um, where it's it's much it's become kind of de facto line to just throw out all of these forms, which you know, frankly, have been very successful in a lot of parts of the world in delivering 
you know, real material changes to masses of people. So I actually think looking at that history and really seriously thinking of how we would revivify or freshen those forms is um, a much needed thing. And I say that especially for somebody, you know, from somebody from like my, with my own experience who again, you know, I wasn't, didn't have an opportunity for a very long time to ever really understand the effectiveness that these old forms of struggle really had. That may be a good place to uh, end this uh, uh, conversation. I think people are still hungry for your ideas, but people may still just be hungry at this point. Um, and uh, the the next event on our uh, on our uh, day's activities is actually uh, eating the food that's been uh, put on the table for us. And then I think we reconvene for a screening uh, in about just over an hour, an hour and 10 minutes. But thank you very much, uh, Jennifer and Mike.
All right. All right, well, wonderful. Um, I am going to introduce our filmmakers, and then we will have a bit of a conversation, which I will describe the process of in a moment. And I can barely see, so bear with me. I actually have to look over my glasses to read. Carol Lynch. <laughs> Kara Lynch is a time-based artist who lives in exilio in Indian territory, conjuring autonomy for black and indigenous people across diaspora. Kara's art practice is rememory, vision, and movement. Collective feminist practice and social intervention animate Lynch's aesthetic political explorations of time and space. This artist's practice is vigilantly raced, classed, and gendered, Black, queer, and feminist. Lynch is anchor artist for invisible, episodic multi-site installations excavating the terror and resilient beauty of Black Indigenous experiences, and co-editor of We Travel the Spaceways, Black Imagination Fragments and Diffractions, an edited volume of Black Speculation, and director of Black Russians, a featured documentary video. So that was just the trailer, yeah. Current explorations include Rule Reverse, a series of video interventions learn, learning from Sylvia Winter's masquerade, a masquerade. Come Prepared or Not at All, a series of drawings concerned with black towns and futures. Stories from the Core, a collaboration with Zara and Mariam Ahmed and Blues You, a bi-monthly radio show on radiocoyote.org slash FM 90.1 in Tulsa. Kara completed the MFA in Visual Arts at the University of California, San Diego, and has been a research fellow at the African and African Diaspora Studies Department, University of Texas, Austin, and the Academy of African Studies at Bayreuth University in Germany. Kara is an emeritus professor of video and critical studies at Hampshire College, a 2020-2022 Tulsa Art Fellow, host of Blues U, a bi-weekly radio show, which I told you about, and a principal artist with Gallery of the Streets and a co-shaper of Black August in Motion. So welcome, Kara Lynch. And I, I'm reading this all for the record. I know pretty much everyone could read it for themselves. Sonia Vash Borges is an assistant professor in history and Africana studies at Drexel University. She describes herself as a militant interdisciplinary historian and longtime social and political organizer. Born and raised in Portugal, she is the daughter of Cabo Verdean immigrants to Portugal during the colonization time. Vash Borges has a passion for interdisciplinary history with a great focus on the silenced histories of people and people's actions and roles during historic moments of socio-political change. The liberation struggles and social movements around the world and the international solidarity in relation to the fields of education and memory are some of her research interests. Her militant interdisciplinarity is made through an anti-colonial, decolonial, and militant research, is made through, excuse me, anti-colonial, decolonial, and militant research and writing. Her most recent book, barely, <laughs> <laughs> Militant Education, Liberation, Struggle, and Consciousness, the PAIGC Education in Guinea-Bissau, 1963 to 1978, was published in 2019. The interdisciplinarity of her research practice can be found in various exhibitions and in film production, as we've just seen. We, she co-authored uh, two short films, so in, in addition to Schol de um, Tarefa, uh, the other is called Navigating the Pilot School. And currently, Sonia is working on a research book proposal grounding on her concept of the walking archives that focuses on the liberation struggle in its in, intrinsic relations. And I think it's true that you've just finished a book that's going to come out from Inkata or Left Word. You, you've just finished another book that's coming out soon. Um, 
with Vijay Prashad. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Modesty will get you nowhere in this company. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do is um, first, our um, keynote speakers are going to reflect on each other's work. Then each will talk a little bit about their own work, what they were trying to do and how and why. And then we're going to open up for Q&A with the audience. Is that pretty much it? OK. So. Take it away. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, sorry. Um, OK, my impressions of this beautiful, beautiful film. Um, I had the opportunity to see it, like preview it, but on a computer screen, so not the same. And I think one of the scenes that is um, still very present and haunting for me is somewhere in the middle of the piece. We're looking at the mangrove in, and it just feels like a tangle of roots. And we've just heard a bit about how, um, how this tree operates in the ecosystem with humans. And then slowly, the young people start to take their place. And all of a sudden, we're in a schoolroom. And for me, those moments in, in this film are, are just like, um, they, they just are so striking and deep, because then it feels as though throughout that anywhere can be that space of liberation anywhere can be that place of learning together. And at the same time, there's a way that that scene, I understand it as both the present, but also a reenactment of the legacy of the revolutionaries that are being described as hiding in the mangrove and in order to keep this education alive. Um, and so for me, that's like this really amazing moment in the piece where everything, um, it's like we, it's like all the things that we've learned so far about this space and about that education come together. Um, and then there are also these amazing scenes where hands just come out of the water the same as the uh, roots of the mangrove. Um, and I, I guess like the way that I relate to it is in thinking about mangroves also as walking trees. So I'm so excited about this idea of a walking archive. Um, you know, that the mangroves move and to imagine that the, you know, folks who are in this ecosystem with the mangroves are also on the move. It's a space outside of surveillance. It's a space that people are making for themselves and others. Um, yeah, those are some first impressions. I don't know. I mean, there are all these things about like learning the place, the space, and the activities of this liberation or of this um, pedagogy, and also imagining you all making this film together, because it does really feel like a cooperative experience. Um, so those are the things that are like most present for me about this piece, or like very exciting. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. I'm sure we are going to discuss more on on that uh, scene that you that you uh, mentioned, or the many scenes that in the film, but especially this one that you you just mentioned. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit about your fi uh, your um, films, yeah. um, and I'll start with the public installation. Uh, because of this, the several sound, the the several sounds that appears uh, in, in in the piece, 
And that makes me remember why I never use headphones when I'm walking outside, because I really like to be aware of the environment that is around. Um, so I, I, I very much liked uh, like all these sounds and just the, the heaviness of, of, this, um, of this piece. And I really would like you to talk about more about how it came about, from where these sounds are coming from. And especially because three, no, Another, uh, your last film is also by the water, so I see the element of water very often in this, um, in, in your piece. Uh, so that that was really striking to me, like to to the last uh, piece finish with water, and when you, we jump to Skol de Terraf, we start with water. So it's like the element of water, just the com the continuous flowing. Uh, so that uh, and because we are talking so much about sounds. It, it really uh, made me think about this, this, this constant flowing of water and the heaviness of water, but at the same time, the fluidity of it, and also how uh, people uh, who were attending, the, who were assisting the installation, uh, what kind of feelings all this brought to them. So I would like to know more about, about that. And with the travel log, I, I, I literally love it because it made me remember like I was in Guinea-Bissau, but without sound. <laughs> um, and uh, it made me think about this uh, idea of the liberation struggle um, of, we've, we have very few diaries of uh, liberation, uh, people who are uh, in the liberation struggle like in Guinea-Bissau uh, writing diaries about. So to have a travelogue of someone uh, expressing their uh, like with several other ideas, of course, the, the, the boy or girl and sexuality, uh, the being in the city, and then you have all these background uh, images, and then uh, the title of the, of the piece is like, I'm coming, so it's like, think what is coming? Uh, is, the, is, the, is Nakuma who's coming? Is the person who's talking who's coming? And who's coming? Is a boy or is a girl? So it really made me, made me think uh, about it. And... Uh, because it's a travelogue and you have all these uh, scenes of women carrying things uh, on their head, it really made me link to the, the process of walking, like this constant walking. What uh, do they carry? Where do they go? What kind of ideas do they carry in their heads? What kind of knowledge do they bring in their heads? And is, is a boy or is a girl who's carrying that? Uh, what kind of boys or girls is, she, uh, is this person uh, carrying along, along the way? So it made me reflect about the, the travelogue and the process of walking. Uh, and what kind of walking are we talking about? Is this walk that we do every day to work? Is this long process of walking, long term of walking? From where is this walking coming from? Which relates uh, with what we've been talking since uh, yesterday of what um, the influences of past struggles in today is. They are part of the walk today. Where did they all walk? If the walk stopped, if it didn't, where does it go? And how do we pick up that same walk? So thank you very much for sharing. The pieces are really, it was really striking to see. <laughs> You're very welcome. Ah, uh, yes, I'll share some context. <laughs> uh, and I'll start with uh, the, the mangroves. I must confess that when I start, when I first time I, I heard the word mangrove and tahaf, I had no idea what they were talking about. I don't know the word, uh, the, the word in Portuguese and in Creole. I didn't know the word because my uh, Creole is from Cape Verde and we don't have uh, mangroves in, in Cape Verde. And I was born in Lisbon, so we don't have mangroves in Lisbon. Um, so. When I interview the people who were uh, uh, talking about the schools uh, in 2013, no, 2014 in Guinea-Bissau, I went through all the interview without, they were talking about mangroves and, uh, and then it comes of course the question of the translation. In my head, mangroves are associated with mangoes, like a field of mangoes. <laughs> <laughs> but toward the, like in the middle of the, the conversation, I realized that it was not the same thing. <laughs> like what they were describing was far away from a, ma a mango uh, tree field. Uh, but what happens, like 
I didn't want to interrupt the process of them describing the, the schools and their lives in the schools and so on. So I went on for an hour and a half, like saying, yes, I am understanding what you're saying. Um, and then at the end, they are looking at me like puzzled. And I turned to them, I was like, I actually don't know what you, a mangrove is. <laughs> So then they draw, uh, like then I, I had my first lesson, like one of, one of the many lessons, but like this one, like they are drawing actually the mangrove on a piece of paper. This is this, this is that, and so on. And at the end, they wanted to throw, after they, we, we, are, we finished the interview, that we are talking, now I know what a mangrove is, we are all in the same page. Uh, or at least I have the imaginary, because then I had to Google, like how does a mangrove look like? Um, and then we are uh, packing to, to leave, and they pick up the piece of paper where they draw the mangrove, and they want to throw away. Uh, and I was like, no, 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 don't throw it away. This, this is historical material. I'm an historian. <laughs> you can't throw it away. So I brought the, the, the image with me, then uh, I included it in the book. So this is to say that I didn't, uh, I didn't know what a mangrove is, was at the time. And when the... The Tom Allard, who we, uh, with whom uh, Philippe and I already had worked in 2016, from where he came the film um, uh, Navigating the Pilot School, when he invited us to continue to contribute for the exhibition that he was going, that he was curating on Education Shock, then uh, Philippe and I were discussing what, how are we going to prepare, what are we going to bring uh, for this uh, exhibition, and of course, uh, conversation back and forth. It came the, we went to, to, to my book, and it's like, okay, there is the mangrove schools. And that's how uh, the film uh, ca came, came about. And of course, uh, one thing is to see the mangrove on the, um, on the pictures, and the other thing is to be in the mangrove, and then to walk to the mangrove. So the scene that you, that you were referring of, the, the students then like using the, the roots to enter then the school is, is, um, is, is, is very interesting because like we basically were a week without setting our foot in a solid land. Uh, it was water or mud, that's all, all roots of, of the mangrove. That was all, all we had. So it's, um, the, the, this scene actually gives a perspective of how we, the conditions of work uh, but also, to, it's, it was interesting to see the progress from building the school till the point of where the where this space that we don't know what is going to happen then becomes a school, and then you have the the, the childrens there, and you have uh, on the background on the last scene uh, already the, the whole community there also participating. Like it was voluntary. Like at at some point in the middle middle of the shooting, we start to realize. Oh look! All these people is here, and they are using the cardboards, whatever cardboards they we had it uh, there to actually uh, copy the lesson that we are uh, doing on the board. So it was very interesting to see the space actually becoming a school, and then go back and reflecting on this process of um, um, uh, of of how a school uh, came came about, and also. Uh, from the text from, that introduces the, the, the film, like the process of walking. Like if in 2013 I had a lesson of what a mangrove was, in 2020 then I had to learn how to walk from asphalt to rice fields to the mangrove. So that was another lesson of the process of walking. And uh, more or less it's like to see the mangrove school as a continua uh, constant uh, walking or a constant continuation of learning. Uh, that the film, I think, opens doors to. I think I answered. <laughs> <laughs> so I give it to you. <laughs> um, yeah, we have a loose plan. Um, so I'll try to answer your question about the installation piece, um, the sound performance um, called Save and kind of give a context, I guess, for the work. Um, and thank you, I really appreciate like understanding that how much that scene shares and also this idea of walking as a learning. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I guess one 
way that I'll link that to this project save, which was the, it's the piece that includes community and we're at the bridge in Harlem. Um, and it's an elegy. It's meant to be a living elegy to Laura Nelson and L.D. Nelson, who were mother and son, who were lynched in 1911 um, at a bridge in Okima, Oklahoma. Um, the piece um, for people who arrived to it was that you received um, you receive the invitation to arrive at the base of that bridge. So it's um, locals call it Harlem Beach. It's um, just below the bridge at 145th that goes from Harlem to the Bronx. Um, and people are invited to arrive at that tree under the bridge. And then another group of people have been um, invited earlier to be witnesses and they met at the base of the bridge itself to walk across it. And they were instructed to wear white. Um, and they, as a group, were given um, a short score, which was just to follow the docent who was with them, and that they could decide together how they wanted to cross the bridge. And then below, which you can kind of get a sense People are gathered, and then at some moment, the crowd breaks up, and a group of those who've arrived become the choir. And then they gather around the tree. Um, and this score um, that we developed is about 25 minutes. And while the choir um, and their directors create the score for us. There are no words. It's all um, vocalization and clapping and snapping. Um, and the composer talks about it as being a collective wail or a moan. Um, meanwhile, the folks bearing witness on the bridge cross the bridge, and they recreate the original photograph of Laura Nelson, L.D. Nelson's death at the bridge. Um, and at the end of the video postcard, you see that people have been given a postcard. And so the idea for this piece is that the, you know, nowhere in the piece itself is their story told. The idea is that we're going to collectively mourn and create this elegy and at the end we'll leave with some souvenir just as folks who had been at the original lynching would have left with a souvenir a postcard of the lynching um, and in this case my hope is that something has transformed about this story that it's now a different um, story that by linking it to um, legacies of resistance and resilience in our communities, in the legacy of um, an aftermath of slavery and the legacy of lynching and this extra legal violence, that somehow we will have moved this story um, through our bodies. And, and also it's about redistributing the weight of the story so more people are carrying it when they leave. Um, Making the piece included um, a number of years of uh, education, in some ways, working with gospel choirs, um, one in Newark, New Jersey, um, and two in Harlem, and then most importantly, working with Impact Repertory Theater um, in Harlem. Um, and some folks may have recognized Jamal Joseph in the in the video postcard. So he's kind of the main creative director of this youth empowerment um, project, Impact Repertory. And we started working with them. Um, and it's really their work, those youth. They um, created the first iteration of the score for the song. 
So we did these exercises with them. Jamal um, facilitated it where we did sound, these breathing and sound circles. And we, so I had um, done some field recordings in Oklahoma and I had created a sound piece called Church, which incorporates sounds from the bridge in the present day. And then um, some recordings from a Juneteenth celebration in Galveston and some other things to create the sense of that place. And I shared that sound piece with the young people. And then we shared their story of this lynching. And, um, and they were most drawn or struck by the fact that their community, Laura Nelson LD's community, could not come to claim their dead. So the youth took that story and they and they did this breathing circle together. And from that, the composer Courtney Bryan developed the score for four uh, choirs in four part harmony, but it's also an experimental score. Um, but the youth continued to work on their own. So they also developed their own kind of middle section, which you can see some of their um, movement that they also added to it. So um, it, and that process that we learned from impact, we then brought to the gospel choirs. So we did the same thing with them and that we shared the story. Their choir directors were, um, saw this as a educational project for their congregation, their choir members. And they then did their own sound circles. And then as Courtney developed the score, they then were prepared to kind of take this very experimental sacred music score and make it their own. Um, and then the other things we learned from the gospel choirs, or I specifically learned from them, is like they were not ministering. So we had to really understand for them, this was an educational project. They were also presenting, not performing, and they weren't ministering. However, all of the, um, it's like all of what they know from ministering as a choir, which is like bringing people into this emotional space going as low as possible and then bringing everybody back up into this space of joy and the kind of transformation that that takes then got translated into this project because that's what they brought with them. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else about the structure of it to share, but I feel like that kind of learning, circular learning that we all kind of learned from each other in the process is is really a lot of how the piece held. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the travel log? <laughs> if I can remember <laughs> anything. Well, you'll have to ask a specific question. Uh, like how does the how did the travel log came about? Like from where is the poem coming from? Uh, how did you collect these uh, old images from, from Ghana, uh, and then to put all these pieces together. Thank you. Yeah, it's like ancient history. 1997, where were you? I was in Accra. Anyway, um, there's proof. Um, so all of that Super 8 footage I shot, and because it was the 40th anniversary, there were all of these um, parades and festivals and people gathering in like the plaza. So I shot all of everything in there I shot. And that, so that's in Super 8, though it does feel like the archive. Um, but it's interesting next to your piece because it is folks. I mean, those processions are, yeah, they're like, dedications, but they're also recreations. 
you know, like, let's keep remembering what this was. So we're going to do it as it was done before. So it feels like maybe it was, you know, 1967, 19, you know. Um, and then the poem I wrote. Um, and the occasion to make the piece, you know, I went to Festpaco that year as a representative for Thurble Newsreel, which I want to give a shout out to Thurble Newsreel. Um, yeah, family. And um, I went representing Ada Gay Griffin's film on Audre Lorde. I was like the rep for Thurble Newsreel. They took a chance to send me. And then I stayed longer and I traveled. And, um, and when I came back, I didn't know what I was going to do with that material. Um, but I, this, this writing came to me and I was like, okay, let's, let's try and make something out of it. And the idea was to make more of these kind of coming out stories that are travel logs. Um, but there's only one other one. This one. And that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we had said we might talk about education and images and making art, um, but I'm also open for any other. I mean, Ruthie, if you have things you would like us to talk about or people beyond us. Well, you know, I didn't bring my fine chronometer up here. How are we doing? Can you see it? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, we have lots of time. So I would love, if um, the audience is willing, for us to have one more um, round with, with Kara and, and Sonia talking about education. Liberation was another key word. I mean, I made up the title of this session called Pic Picturing Revolt. And while I had not seen your work, Kara, I had seen um, Sonia's film. And what struck me was that for many people arriving, not knowing about Sonia's project, to our gathering today, they would imagine that Picturing Revolt would not look as it did. And yet, to me, this is what it looks like. It's not all that it looks like, but it very strongly looks like this film. So revolt, liberation, I mean, there's also the, the issue, Kara, of, um, of mourning and history and so many things, as well as Nkrumah. It's very nice to have his name in the air, um, always. So if maybe you talk a little bit more, you both already have a bit about education as you understand it and the, the work that Telling stories otherwise, as you do in your work, um, both represents and makes possible liberation. Both. I wonder if there's any water. Um, the, there is two. The, 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 there are two elements in the film um, that I also wanted to relate with the, our conversation this afternoon on the revivifying. I think it was uh, Denning who brought the, the topic. Uh, and in the film, I, uh, I think you notice there is uh, an old school manual, a red school manual. And that is an original uh, material from 1960s uh, that I found in, um, in, a, in an online uh, site, uh, like where they sell old stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
And um, so the, 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 the school manual is from 1960, is, uh, is signed, uh, and it's already like more than 50 years old, and it's being circulating the world from end to end. And somehow it came to my hands, and you can see it there in the film. And the interesting thing on this with the school manual uh, is that uh, once it arrived to Guinea-Bissau in the circle that we're doing about discussing the liberation struggle and discussing the, the school uh, materials and looking at the manual, uh, there was an image of one freedom fighter from the PIGC who's now uh, is mentally ill. So when, when I see the, the image, it doesn't say nothing to me. Well, it didn't uh, said nothing to me till the time that this book is circulating with, with students, or ex-students who use this book uh, when they were studying at the PIGC schools. And then they say, like, this person is still alive. And he lives uh, uh, like he's mentally ill. He lives in the middle of the jungle. His family just uh, still goes uh, there and treat, treats of him, tr uh, take care of him, but he doesn't want to leave that space. So that is just another way of revivifying the, the material and bring it back instead of just having it uh, uh, behind glasses. Uh, and also another interesting history with this uh, school manual is that the women that you see in the film, they, had, um, they were organizing a, a school for them to learn how to read and to write. And when they had access to the school manual, they asked, can you just please make copies and send it to us so we can uh, learn to read and to write through this book or with this book? So it's another way of seeing like how this process of education that started in the 1960s is still valuable uh, today uh, and how we can still uh, use it today. Uh, and there is another school manual that is the one that is on the images, uh, on, the, on the postcard. Uh, and is a math school is a is, is a math tech textbook. It was written in 1969-1971, and it was from the liberation movement in Mozambique. It was made by uh, designed by uh, um, a math teacher from the ex -DD, no, uh, GDR uh, in Mozambique. And the book was used then uh, in liberation movements in Angola and in, 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 in Guinea-Bissau by the PIGC. And the interesting uh, history of this school manual is that I've been searching for it for almost eight years. Uh, I could not find it in archives. I could not find it online. So I, I only knew, I knew that the book exists because I saw one image of, of, of it. And all the people that I interview, they were much, oh, and there was also the school, the math textbook. Uh, and it was during COVID that I was bored at home. Uh, and of course you do online, like I was online shopping, like throwing names on Google, like see what's, what's happened here. Uh, <laughs> and then I was like, okay, let me check uh, if I can, if there's something about the math book. From time to time I was, I was Googling the, the book to see if it comes up somewhere. And actually, in this search, the book came up. The book that I was searching for eight, nine years uh, just appeared on a random secondhand uh, online shop. Uh, and I immediately bought it. And when I, was, uh, when I found the book, we were actually doing the film, like uh, selecting the, the selecting, editing the film, like selecting the, the, the scenes, the materials that was, we are going to uh, put there. Uh, and the interesting thing is that then we use the, the images of the, of the school manual for the film, which is another way of revivifying the, 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 the material. And it was striking to me to see the, exerci the math exercises that they had to solve, how uh, the liberation struggle and the military terms was so ingrained on how to teach math, um, which is... Uh, is, is, is very inter interesting to see how one learns math and how one creates the school material for uh, this moment that we are, uh, that they were teaching, which again links with the film that uh, we saw yesterday of the school manual that is found 
in the in the in the middle of the the distra uh, destruction site, so to say. So to think about uh, education is uh, and how this uh, material can still be used in arts and how is a vehicle to think how we can continue to use it today in uh, a visual form, but also in a very practical form that. Uh, people can still learn how to read and write from these manuals, I think is very important to think uh, about the artistic part of, of it uh, and education. Yeah, there's so much. I, I also want you to speak a little bit about the process of working with a filmmaker um, and the editing, because I'm you had said something about building the narrative and that that was really interesting to you. And it feels like this piece, I'm thinking about Ruthie, your question of um, imaging otherwise, and this might not be, neither of our works might not be what people imagine when they're thinking of revolutionary visuals or art or what black people in protest um, and I feel as though in your piece, the teaching also is in how we are led into looking in all of these different moments within it, like how to understand the mangrove, just as you did, how to also really put together um, the folks who hold, like still carry the information about why folks went into the mangroves to hold the education, you know, like that all of that you circle us into within both the information, like the voiceover, but also visually how we enter this space, like seeing people working and making the space, seeing, um, yeah, just like, really what it means to be in the mangrove, you kind of teach us it as viewers. Um, so I'm so curious about that process of deciding how to make this piece. It's not a traditional documentary, mm -hmm. right? Um, we so uh, Philippe and I and another group of people, we were in Guinea-Bissau for uh, three weeks. It was in the middle of the pandemic. It was the only window that Portugal opened the borders with Guinea-Bissau and with Germany. So that it was September, the borders opened. We had, we are hoping that the borders were going to open. So we prepare everything beforehand. And as soon as the border opened, we just we just flew to Guinea Bissau and we were there for three weeks. So what we see in the film is like two weeks uh, is uh, two weeks of workshop and one week uh, in the mangrove. Uh, that's uh, so there was a, a, a whole uh, activity of a project that Sananad and Philippa Cesar are doing in Abisau for with the media tech uh, that they are building. Uh, and I was giving uh, one workshop on liberation struggles and education there. So the voiceovers that we hear is part of the of the workshop. So it means that they have their own images. And then you have all this uh, process. When we mentioned that we wanted to do a short film uh, about the the schools and the liberation struggle, and we mentioned the schools in the mangrove, our idea was just like, yeah, we can build like a small table there uh, and that will be, we'll figure out what kind of stories we are going to to to, to tell because we had a couple of images that we wanted in the film uh, but then it was the community who said no we build the school uh, we can build a school uh, so what we see in the film is this process of building the school and also the process of imagine through my through the descriptions the photos that we had about schools somewhere else, not in the mangroves, because they don't exist anymore. And there is no, there is actually no picture of schools in the mangroves. So we have to imagine these schools, or they imagine these schools based on the images that 
uh, the photos from the schools in the forest. Uh, and they build the school, so we have the process of, of building the school. Uh, and of course, there is this old dynamic of moments that uh, start to emerge, to pop up, uh, like the, the person that was just teach the first lesson in the mangrove school is how to smoke. Uh, <laughs> which is like, how do you do like this thing to, to smoke, which, is just what, which Yaya was just there doing that. Like he was not even thinking as to be part of the film. And then we realized that he was doing that and was like, okay, let's shoot this film, this scene. Or when the pencil falls on the water, which is like, it happened first time, like if, if it really felt accidentally. And the um, uh, yeah, uh, Jenny, who is, who is the girl, she actually did the same gesture. So it's like, can you repeat again? That's why the second scene seems very fake. Like we see really that she's dropping the on purpose. <laughs> um, and then when we, when we went home, it's just like, we have all this material and let's see how we are going to, to put it together. And our fear was like, we have to do this in a way that it doesn't look so kitschy, like so, so much propaganda, like uh, especially because the PIGC of 96 is not the PIGC of uh, 2021. So we have like this very thin line not to fall on the PIGC of today. Uh, and when we are watching all this, uh, hours and hours of, of, of shooting, uh, we start to select some images or some, some uh, part excerpts of, of, of the, of the we, we start to select like uh, quite some hours of it. And then you start to reduce it. And it is true seeing these scenes uh, so much that then the history starts to, to unveil how we are going to present. So it, it's not that we create um, a guideline which scenes are going to be after this, that, and that, but it's more, let's watch what we have, let's hear what we have, let's go and reflect, let's select a big chunk, let's see how we feel with that, let's see what scenes we can take it out. So it's more this process of constructing the narrative by sitting together, having tea, having coffee, <laughs> discussing about many other things, and then just, just let the scenes talk, talk, talk to us without creating a, a, a guide for it. And it's actually uh, by sharing these experiences that we had in the mangrove that then the film connected with the images that we are seeing that everything came, to, came, came about. Uh, and still it was a struggle like we can't, we can't have this scene because then it make, us too, make, us, uh, make it too long because we wanted to put everything. Uh, but at the same time, we have to make it short. Uh, and at the same time, like to create this imaginary, like this picture of the, this, the liberation struggle. Because um, I think uh, Philippa showed the film to one of her students. And the, um, the comment was, it's too beautiful. It's like, but it's, it's, it also forces us to think we are expecting, like, uh, as Ruthie said, guns, uh, armored people. Uh, all, all these um, images that we have about war. And I, this film is, is very much about war. War is there present all the time, but it's not visible in the way that we are expecting it, expecting it to, to happen. Well, violence is also there. Learning is also there. Loving is also there. Uh, especially because the, the Pedro, the person that you see in and out of water, he's actually a teacher. He's actually, he teaches the students. Uh, he was the one... Uh, checking the, the area because there were crocodiles around and like we, we have to take care of it uh, for, none of, for all of us to be out of here alive. Um, so you have this, this very much care of how um, uh, the struggle or the, the revolt or the liberation struggle really happened. It was a violent process from both sides, but at the same time, it has uh, it happened in in these beautiful in these beautiful uh, spaces, and instead of showing just the the war side in a more uh, dramatic way, like we we see it to, we normally is, is presented, we have like this 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 uh, picturing of revolt that you actually have all these layers of war, but still in a very different uh, background that we are normally expecting.
Um, yeah, I one of the things that draws me to that layering of representation is that you know in tr in thinking about okay, what does it mean to um, represent black political subjectivity? also means what does it mean for black people to be subjects, like to have interiority um, and what um, Kevin Kwashi calls the sovereignty of quiet. Um, and so there are all of these moments in, in your film where that's possible while in community, that it's like a collective practice and this opportunity to recognize ourselves and others as yeah like having this integrity and quiet interiority and that that's also a political space um is very powerful um but i think yours also shows that very in a great. very powerful way I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> because the the um, you have all this process of mourning. Uh, and I, I do remember of seeing like these two images where you have the old image, an uh, old image and a more recent image. Um, and you talk about this process of, uh, we don't know what they are mourning. At least I didn't have the, that perception from, from the beginning, but I, I could see that they were mourning. I could see that it, it was touching people. So you have also this, this uh, you, you, you transmit this process of revolt through, through mourning, but in a very, in a very uh, human way. In a very, without ex, you are not exposing no one, uh, but you, through the sounds, through the images, you can feel that, uh, that process too. Um, I'm glad <laughs> that that comes across. And I think the other thing that you had mentioned earlier around sound mm -hmm. is a huge part of it. And um, that has been where my work has been going more recently is in to the, the field of sound and listening as much as in the image world, though I come from video um, and performance. It's, um, it's just like the, there are too many images or it's like hyper conspicuous our bodies and how we're represented. Um, but there's something about opening a field of sound and space that can become more of an embodied practice and be in these stories as opposed to spectators to them or um, so I'm glad that that I mean, I'm, you know, this is I'm encouraged that the video also gets across the experience that folks did have in the space in at the, the space. time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And actually there was a, uh, a phrase that you had in the film, I think it's from this one, that you said, it is like it never happened and, it feel, and we feel it in our bones. So it's, it's, it, it transmits exactly the, like without, the, the, the phrase came, came later, but uh, by the time it came, I already had felt it in, in my bones to see uh, uh, these these images with the sound. It was is, is very powerful. Well, comrades, shall we open it up? Invite more okay. comrades to yeah. participate. Hello. Um, I'm very grateful to have seen your films tonight and to hear your remarks. Um, I really enjoyed it. And Kara, I was so mesmerized by that film of The Creek, which was, uh, seemed to have suds on it, and then the uh, cross with acres on it. And I just would love to hear anything that you care to say uh, more about that. Thank you. I'm happy to. Um, that is a like a loop video that's from a larger project called Invisible. And that particular piece um, 
was made in some ways as an elegy to New Orleans after Katrina, after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and the way, the ideal way of seeing it would be on a small 13-inch um, monitor that's on the ground and shrouded by a white sheet, but with the um, screen opened up. So you would be looking down at it, um, and it's set up like an altarpiece. Uh, and it's, um, it's part of Invisible, which is um, this project that asks this impossible question, what if the transatlantic slave trade never happened? And it places us into a future space asking this question. And I, I guess at this point, I would say the other main question of that piece is, how will we be free? And so Invisible is saved. The piece at the bridge is a part, an episode of Invisible. So it places us in these um, historical events or moments and um, attempts to transform that that time and space, but also bring you into it um, and embody it in another way. Thank you um, both so much for these films and for the conversation. Um, Sonia, uh, in the spirit of uh, this morning's panel where we were hearing a lot about how bad institutions are, I want to uh, open up or invite you to, uh, to comment on the ways in which, not necessarily institutions, but instituting can kind of like play within a liberation framework. And I'm really struck by the, the, the production of this you know, educational space in the mangrove as being something that's self-organized, that's pragmatic, that comes out of a, um, the situation of struggle, right? But that also, um, and it's temporary, if I didn't say that, um, but that also suggests the, the kind of like necessity for building at least provisional structure through which to do the work of study, you know? Um, and I'm just curious if you're thinking, because you're thinking about education, um, about the form, like the way in which, um, something like education gets kind of reimagined within these revolutionary contexts or these, these liberation struggle contexts. Um, how these places are reimagined. Uh, I think one of the first things that I learned about liberation struggle and education was that they were using uh, Portuguese textbooks to teach how to read and write. But in this process, they had to reimagine the information that it was there, how we are going to teach these colonial books with colonial content in a form to create liberation. Uh, and that was, was, was really interesting to see the process of uh, decolonizing the books happening in loco during the liberation struggle. And it's not just decolonizing, it was not just decolonizing the books, but decolonizing the self, because they, the teachers, went through the process, went through the process of colonial education. So in order to teach the, the book, they have to do two kinds of decolonization their decolonization and the colonization of the book in order to teach it in a liberatory form. So I think this is a way of seeing um, this uh, reimagination of, of, of education. Um, and of course, during this uh, liberation, during the liberation struggle, it was a, they, they were very pragmatic, uh, very, very pragmatic in the way we are going to build the schools. They had uh, pragmatic and strategic because they could not build the schools anywhere they, uh, because as you could see in the film, there was the air bombing or the the people the the boats coming from 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 the river and just invade the the, the villages. So they had to be uh, very uh, pragmatic. 
And uh, by building uh, institutions, and well, building institutions and making other film, is that what you mean? Or just in terms of education, institutions? I think more about education and institutions. Mm. Okay, education as an institution. Hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> I think we 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 are all here institutionalized in a way. <laughs> we all were forced to go to school, <laughs> one thing or not, and it was not even our decision or our parents' decision. It was the state decision. Just you have to send your your kids to school, so that comes a part of of the institution. Um, so to think about uh, bring it, bringing to today education as an institution is still, is still there. Uh, the thing is, uh, how are we going to, to use this, uh, this institution that we call education? And, what, and it, it's basically doing the same process that the liberation movement did in the past. This, it, it, education is there. The material is there. The, the materiality of it is there, how we are going to use it, and how we are going to reimagine the using of it, which is very inspiring for me. Uh, when I'm reading uh, like a very colonial book, how I'm going to use it, how I'm going to reimagine this information in order to create liberation. And I think that's, that's one of the main uh, things that I learned during this project of militant education. This is a part of the, the militancy or the, that was already not, I, I like not, I prefer, it's not just that militant education was just between, within this period, 1963 and 1978. It's like, it's a long process. And it ha in, in this case, it, ha it started to happen in Lisbon or it happened also in Guinea-Bissau in the city like clandestine study groups. So it's another way of reimagining all these materials that we are, institutional materials that we have. I hope I answer. <laughs> no further questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Uh, just to comment on that, one of the things I thought was so striking was almost a tension in that earliest moment where there's the voiceover talking about education and clearly schooling in education. And what we see is an extraordinary skill of building <laughs> the place and the reeds tying together, which perhaps is just my old film thing. I keep feel, seeing film strips in the weaving together of the reeds and all of that. And at that early moment, there seems a tension between the school and the making of the reeds and putting that together. And yet, by the end, there's a wonderful visual rhyme between the guy who is chopping off the end of the mangrove and then the, car the sharpening of the pencil, which I think is a wonderful bringing together of those two moments. So. There is one particular thing that I, one, 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 one of the scenes of the film that really makes me cry is the last part when the, the children are singing. And so they go uh, saying like, Kumanja, Kumanja, Sa Kumanja, you have to go down. Uh, so it's like, for me, it's a symbol of oppression, like oppress. And then at the end, it's like, um, rise up. So it's like, now stand up. So it's, 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 it's very touching for me to think about of all this process of oppression, you have to go down or continue to, to put the, the people down. Uh, and then they are the ones that are like, now please rise up, which is, is for me is very powerful too uh, in, in the film, like a, a, a way of imagining the future or creating the future by the process of rising up. I'm going to take Mike Holder's privilege to ask the next question. Kara, <laughs> um, it's something that relates to a number of your films, I think, but um, you were talking about it um, with regard to the, the piece on the bridge. And you were talking about this um, kind of transformation that happens and this, um, pra this communal practice, right? This uh, practice of people together with their bodies in space. And, um, but there's, there's the time-based practice of the actual thing people are doing together and then there's 
your record of it and and the way in which you work with that record. And um, there's this thing that you work with the video with, which I'd like to ask you about, and I'll make a reference to another film in which you distort the image in a certain way that to me, it touches me in a similar way, right? A way of kind of conveying some of that um, uh, aesthetic experience or alteration or something. And um, I see a kind of similar technique also in rule reverse um, with sound and with time. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to, you know, how you would speak about these things. <laughs> or how you think about them. I don't know what to, what the right question is. <laughs> um, yeah, let me see how to jump in there. Um, well, I was saying to actually Coco earlier that one of the things I hope with the video work as well as the performance work and the sound work is that... Um, that the viewer, the participant, the person who's like taking it in is provided all of the information you need to learn how to engage with it. And also, I, I think one of the big things is rule reverse is a little bit different in some ways because there's a figure in it in a way that these shorter works and are really about um, abstraction, like opening the space where the body enters so that you might feel yourself as the camera in this case, but like in the space and moving with it. So that last piece, there are a, a lot of the work that I've made that's for installation with sound and image are about that, like getting your body into the space of it. Um, so that's the figure that's represented is you as the viewer or who's moving around the work or moving into the work. Um, I think with rule reverse, because it's um, a conversation with Sylvia Winter and this question of masquerade time being this break this moment when ordinary time, which is, you know, capitalist time, which is productivity time, colonial time, um, there is a break from it and everything, we have a chance to actually experience what it's like to, for her, go back to these old rhythms that are linked to the earth and, um, and to our ways and are also going to shift the balance. Um, and I see that as like that transformation that I'm interested in. And then that piece itself is an invocation. So um, I made it within the first three weeks of being in Tulsa, Oklahoma um, in August, 2020. And, you know, watching it now, there are things in on Greenwood Avenue where we did the performance and that are now totally changed. Like there are buildings in that lot, there's a huge building in that lot that's now a museum to the history of Greenwood. Um, the Black Lives Matter um, mural on the street was uh, taken away by the city because um, <clears throat> it caused too much uh, conflict and strife. Um, and a, a number of things that do not exist anymore about the space that are fully documented now in that piece. But for me, it was uh, like my opportunity to in some ways introduce myself to the place. <laughs> Like, here's my invocation. I just arrived. I don't know 
what all is happening here. I don't know which ancestors I should be, you know, greeting or listening to. And I also am new in town. So let me um, in some ways, you know, pour some libation, but also um, cut an edge and see what comes of it. Like if I'm going to be here for a minute, I should start somewhere. Um, and I was also encouraged to do that work because it was part of a collective gallery of the streets um, that is um, at that moment masterminded by Kei Barrow and Jazz Franklin. Um, and then this whole cohort of folks where we were doing public interventions during the election season in different places in the country. Um, and so that performance was sort of a test of some possible interventions that Spy Boy, that character, might do. Um, and then as far as like the visual and sound components, I mean, yeah, I am really wanting to um, push form and content as a political aesthetic process. Um, and conjure something, get people to like embody it and to shift. Um, that's the hope. Yeah. Well, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the ordinary time together with that piece? Like what I mean by ordinary time? Mm -hmm like how ordinary time shows up in that piece? Oh, it's such a good question. Yeah, you know, like in that case, it would be like the highway that's cut through Greenwood um, that <clears throat> fragments what would have been uh, continuing to thrive black community. Um, I think that it's a construction site um, is part of the ordinary time. And also the way that, you know, there's this idea of this heyday of Black Wall Street, Greenwood Avenue being this moment of black excellence, black wealth, all of that. So the, the places where it's also kind of desolate, or the reality that Greenwood Avenue is at this moment one city block, and that's it. And then a lot of um, markers on the ground of all the things that used to be there um, might be um, ordinary time, but I think the hope of that video is that we're just like deep into rule reverse. Like maybe this is a, an opera or like that that figure is invoking the rule reverse to remind us or to give us a sense of like this is what it might feel like if we were in masquerade time walking down a city street. Yeah. Um, thank you both for your films and the, and the conversation so far. Um, I was really uh, moved by, Sonia, how you structured the... First, there's the conversation about the reworking of the gender division of labor within the struggle and as people were struggling. And then later, when the children are making fun of each other for their pronunciation and what they've learned and which animals they are, this sort of very casual moment of saying, oh, like the way you're dressed, you look like uh, you look like a militant from the liberation struggle era. <laughs> and the fact that that's sort of a casual reference that these kids would have and would sort of just throw around in that moment really shows sort of how deep um, the both the memory and the sort of like lived practices and consequences of the struggle are for this generation. So I was really interested uh, I'd be interested to hear from you um, what 
your observations were from working with the children of how they related both to the process of making this and to hearing the stories from the good old days from their relatives or hearing it from people who learn from them or from teachers, you know, how they situated themselves in it and what their relationship to it was. Um, about that scene, I think is one of the few that it was not planned at all. Uh, we are just uh, relaxing after a very painful moment. That's uh, we we shoot the film uh, of them crossing the water, uh, and the girl who has her books in her head. One of the books that she had was the 50 years old book who fell in water, uh, and it was completely wet, and they were panicked. Uh, because they were looking at the book and looking at me and like, what do I do now? <laughs> uh, so uh, I was to relax and like everything needs uh, has the right to have a second life and this book already have more than more than two for sure. So let's try to dry it up, uh, dry it up with with our clothes and then uh, put it uh, like tomorrow everything will be fine. Uh, and then we just uh, after that like. They realized, okay, she's not so upset. They are not so upset. They were sitting on the on this bench, not on the bench, on this uh, how do you call it? tronco branch, <laughs> uh, and they were just uh, teasing each other. Uh, and and for me, it was interesting to see, like after uh, almost three weeks talking about liberation struggle, how they start to create their own imaginary together with the information that they also had before, like here a little here and there about liberation struggle, here here and there about the the PIGC and also about the elections because the PIGC is still an active party in in Guinea Bissau and like just to hear uh, them uh, connecting the the knowledge about the PIGC before and now, uh, connecting the images that uh, were circulating in the workshop connecting the information that they got it from their uh, grandparents um, because uh, they well uh, one two, two of them uh, are grand uh, grandsons of one uh, member of the the PIGC during the liberation struggle who study in these schools so it's very interesting to see them connecting all this all this information and bringing it up like they are teasing each other but in the process of teasing, they show that they know what that means. Uh, and that, for me, it was super interesting to, to, to see, uh, like, um, knowledge happening uh, in local. Like, how, it's not that you are teaching them, like, from A, B, C, this very chronological history. It's like them using their uh, references to create their own narrative and to associate with a person like especially in the terms of how one is dressed <laughs> uh, after a moment of teasing, which uh, teasing, te teasing, like they are being mean to each other, actually. <laughs> I'm going to hide that <laughs> because it's also part, uh, well, we all had these moments at, at school, so it's, I'm not going to, 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 to hide that, but to see like how the conversation develops and to come up at the end like, She's the one that looks and still dresses like a, a freedom fighter, a person from the liberation struggle, a freedom fighter. So it's, it's very interesting to see this, the, they connecting the, by themselves uh, this, this information without having uh, adult assistance, like saying like, oh, uh, or maybe like we don't even interrupt, like you don't call monkey to the other one. Or you don't like just let them be, but see the end uh, of the conversation. That was very, very interesting to see. I think we are just about at time. Connor, would, where are you? There you are. Um, we have a, a brief announcement um, from our comrade Connor. And here comes your machine. And then I will think. Yeah, you do. We're live streaming. Hey, everyone. Um, Will you join me in giving this amazing panel a round of applause for the brilliance 
that was just shared here. Um, if I may just have a moment of your focus, I want to draw attention to a campaign that's happening in the City University of New York right now. Some of you may have heard that the CUNY Chancellor, Felix Matos Rodriguez, and several CUNY presidents and uh, heads of administration have recently returned from a delegation to Israel. And um, this is um, just on the heels of uh, renewed bombings of Israel attacking Gaza. This is on the heels of last year, um, an incredible amount of devastation of people having um, basically being uh, removed from their homes and massive bombardments. Um, for those of us who have been here in CUNY and in New York City, and I'm assuming this is an anti-colonial crowd, um, the City University of New York has long been a bastion of anti-colonial solidarity, and um, in particular, supporting people who are Palestinian and people who are uh, really at um, the receiving end of Zionist aggression that is very much funded by uh, the United States. And so um, at the City University of New York, uh, faculty, staff, students, community members are really calling on the chancellor and on uh, these presidents and uh, top-ranking administrators who had uh, visited Israel under this guise of uh, bridging uh, scholarship. Um, people have questions and people have demands. Um, I want to invite you to uh, go to a link tree for CUNY for Palestine. CUNY for Palestine, along with the Cross CUNY Working Group on Racism and Colonialism, along with Rank and File Action, other organizations, uh, militants in the City University are really asking for people to uh, read this uh, statement that was sent to, to this delegation and to circulate it among your departments, to circulate it among uh, people on, in the campuses and neighborhoods where you're based. So um, once again, I wanna give um, really tremendous gratitude for this conversation and um, hoping that we can, um, with the very real issues that are still impacting our, um, not just our university and city, but very much a global struggle, a global anti-colonial struggle, I'm inviting you to be able to support this campaign to condemn this recent action by these administrators. So thank you for your time. All right, so we, we have come to the end of our time together here at the People's Forum this time around. And I want to thank our hosts of the People's Forum, the collective that makes this such an astonishing, <laughs> astonishing, dare I say, institution in the heart of the city. It's our institution. Um, it's our tools, not, you know, their tools. Um, I want to thank everybody who's presented or moderated a panel today, but and and Sherry and Ernie who had to take off for uh, curating our films last night. It's been astonishing to have so much um, thought made beautiful for us. My friend Howard Singerman defines art as something that's smart and good looking. And we have encountered a lot of stuff that's smart and good looking <laughs> from last night until today. But also we've thought a lot about revolutionary arts um, with that S on the end, which um, I like to think of as life in rehearsal. And from, from the music that we heard about first thing today all the way through from last night until this moment, we, we hear and feel rehearsal after rehearsal after rehearsal. The children, Kara's films, everything. And it matters. And I really love that we could rehearse this together this time. And we'll do it again and we'll do it again. And maybe someday, Jennifer, we will see correctly. <laughs> but in the meantime, we'll remember that practice makes different. So thank you, one and all. May I add one more thank you? Um, well, it's actually a few more thank yous. The first is thanking Fran for insisting that we have ASL interpretation. And a very, very special thank you to our two interpreters, Tyler and Steffi, where are you? 
um, um, uh, for um, accompanying us in our very clumsy first time and endeavoring to, um, to articulate what we are saying in sound to, um, to everyone who wanted to hear us. <laughs> Sorry if that sounds strange, but thank you so much. It's, um, it's a learning process for us and we're very grateful. Ah, okay, um, uh, I'm going to send around a piece of paper that has the link tree for the CUNY for Palestine uh, because it's kind of difficult to say aloud. So I'll just send this piece of paper around so folks can, con you know, link in with that. And I will uh, send around a clipboard with a sign-up sheet for anyone who hasn't signed up. This is not about um, chasing you down, although if you leave your email address, we will put you on our mailing list. It's mainly to uh, justify to CUNY that, um, that we actually fed people today. <laughs> and thank you to the People's Cafe.